Having said uh, all of that, I just want to say a very, very warm welcome uh, to everyone who's joined us today. Um, so as you might be aware, and I'm just hoping that we are being picked up, I see that there is a camera, Gavin, I might have to ask you to move one chair to the right or to the left, because that camera's looking at you. Thank you. Um, there have been significant advances in the treatment of various medical conditions, especially in the areas of oncology and rare and complex diseases in the last two decades. And innovative medicines have played a large role in these advances. For many patients, these advances mean the potential for a better quality of life and more years of life. Sadly, a limited number of patients and a handful of state patients have access to these life-saving interventions. And a problem that requires, this is a problem that requires a multi-stakeholder commitment, given the constitutionality enshrined right of access to healthcare and the associated responsibility to take reasonable measures to achieve this progressive realization. As South Africa, we are moving towards a new time in the sense of access to universal health coverage. And it is necessary for all of us that are entrusted to both plan and deliver such coverage that we begin to find solutions to increase access for patients, ensuring the right to treatment for the right patient at the right time. The search cannot begin um, after the planning and delivery of universal health care, and it must be done now to ensure that we have sustainable universal health care, which delivers the progressive realization of health care rights. This point is very, very well articulated in the Presidential Health Compact, which states that for NHI to be successful, it must be implemented simultaneously with a quality improvement program. In relation to essential medicines and vaccines, Pillar 2 focuses on ensuring improved access to essential medicines, vaccines, and med medicinal products, and herein encourages that we, as society, user groups, and members that are invested in this community recommend options for innovative access models based on the current legal framework and where required make recommendations for the amendments of policy frameworks. And it is with this that Lauren and I as Campaigning for Cancer and Rare Diseases South Africa have decided to really try pull everybody together to host this meeting, inclusive of all key stakeholders to gain an understanding of respect, stakeholders' perspectives, on suitable models to expand patient access to innovation, and two, to gain an understanding of respective stakeholders' concerns related to the various proposed access models that are in circulation at the moment, and three, explore ways in which we can ensure continued structured dialogue in pursuit of answering the call to action espoused in the Health Compact so we, so we can ensure that expanded access. I just wanna share a personal story because for those of us who are not aware, I think many of us that are working in this from a user perspective and are patient advocates, we land up in the situation not because it was a career choice. I'd never seen anyone bring a child to work day as a patient advocate or that being discussed at career day at school. It is something that happens to you and you take up the charge um, due to a personal commitment, either because it is you that's impacted or a loved one. In my case, it was the diagnosis of my son at 11 months old with a very rare condition that required access to a treatment that wasn't yet registered in South Africa. It is incredibly expensive. Um, I joke, I shouldn't because they're in the room, but I always say that when your premiums from Discovery come through every year and there's an increase, blame me, because uh, it's him, It's he's growing, and I'm doing everything I can to cut back on the groceries, believe me, but he's still growing, and as a result, he gets more expensive. But he wouldn't be alive today if he didn't have the benefit of being able to access that treatment. And at that time, access to innovative products was nothing, it was a dream. I was told you will not get it in this country. And I can proudly say that due to being a pissed off mom, for lack of better words, um, and I was like, I'm a millennial, so entitled to some extent. When they said, no, you can't have it, I was adamant that I'd get it. And I fought tooth and nail, and my son started treatment 10 days later after that diagnosis. And he's now 14 years old, smelly, gross, and about to start high school. But that is a story that I can share with love because of the fact that we managed to unlock that access for him. And I couldn't possibly stand here as a proud advocate unless we knew we had done absolutely everything to ensure the same opportunities for all South Africans living in this country, 
in, same, in the same shoes. So with that, I bring this meeting to an open and I'm now going to hand over to Lauren. Thanks, Kelly. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you again for joining us. So, so I wanted to start off, and this some of you may have seen these slides and heard this, but the story still applies. So I'm going to bore you with the same story until the story changes. And I think one of the things that I was sitting once looking at it and saying, you know, what are the four myths we tell ourselves when it comes to undermining access for treatment? And I found, I found four songs that came to, to mind. The first thing is when Ed Sheeran sings about being perfect. And often we feel like we need to replace what we have with perfect. And maybe just one step in the right direction is enough us to do that. So don't, we don't necessarily have to have perfect, we just have to have better. So that's the first. The second is what's going on, and, and you've got, by Marvin Gaye, you've got to give it up. Some of us, in fact, all of us, have to give up a position that we find. Because without giving up that position, no one is going to make a move forward. We're going to stay stuck where we are. And each stakeholder, each role player is going to have to give up something to make sure that we expand access for patients. The second one is the, with the black eyed peas, where is the love? And this speaks specifically to NCDs and rare diseases where we've seen so much innovation in trying to get access for treatment and so much movement from our ideology and our, 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 speak, our points and our lines in the sand in communicable diseases like COVID and HIV and TB, but we're not seeing that in NCDs. And unfortunately, the NCD patients and the rare disease patients are the ones that are suffering the most. They have the diseases that don't have a cure. They have the diseases that are, aren't going to give them. They, are, they can't live 30 years. This, this week, our, our team was told of four people that had had four to six months to live. That's hectic. That's hectic to be told that. And when I look at what they've been given and where they they shouldn't be in that position. They should not be in that position. And the last one is money. Everyone knows where the money sits. We understand who needs to make money. We understand where the money flows. But at the end of the day, we have to look at the lives that that money is looking at and playing. And we have to use that money as effectively as possible to make sure. And we have to derive as much value out of the spend of that money as possible. It's not just about spending the money or not spending the money. It's about asking us, what are we getting out from spending that money? So those are my four songs. And I hope every time you hear them, you think about the line in the sand that you are responsible for and how you will start doing this. The second thing is the advancement of medicine. What does it mean for patients? I'll never, someone asked me that. And my answer to them was, well, it means nothing if they can't access it. You can be the most amazing researcher. You can find the cure to cancer. You can find the cure for a rare disease. If the patient can't get it, it's useless. You might as well have not created it, truly. Because then you're creating it for ego. You're not creating it for the benefit of the patients. So innovation, and advancement without access is ego-driven. So the impact of access. So this is my nephew, Gabriel. Gabriel is six going on 36. He, when he wants to be grow up, he wants to be a soldier. But what he will learn he like out is because you lose every argument you have with him, he will be a lawyer. It is ingrained in him, no argument. And when you ask Gabriel what is his favorite animals, it's a bunny and a creepy crawly. Now you look and you have the same answer that we have, creepy crawly. So this is where the lawyer comes in. You're like, but Gabriel, the creepy crawly is not an animal. He's like, yes, it is. It lives in the water. It eats the leaves. And when you take it out the water, it goes, so it can't breathe. 
how do you fight with that? But that was a piece of innovation that in the 1970s came across in South Africa and was developed in South Africa, purely because we're just lazy. But um, it was something that was developed and we've used and it's become, and now five or six generations down the line, this little boy thinks that this, this is so ingrained into his life. It's an animal for him. My brother has a, a backyard filled with creepy crawly. And he ha the best thing you can do to Gabriel is to take him to the pool shop so he can go into the back and see where the creepy crawlies are and bring and set and rescue all the creepy crawlies. So this, he's engaged this as an animal in his life. But that's how innovation has been integrated into his life. And that's what we should be aiming for. Innovation should be part of the next generation's life. They, should, they shouldn't have to explain that it's innovation. It's just part of their life because then innovation is successful. And I, I look at another thing. This is my friend, Mill. And I travel a lot with Mill because we go to a lot of the international conferences. And the one thing we have between us is when we're ever we're in a in a town, we get we do the red box bus tour so that we can get a, a whistle stop, um, 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 scenic tour of the of the city that we're in. And every time I look at her, she's my dear friend, and I love spending time. But my heart breaks a little bit, and I'm a little bit jealous of her because Mill was diagnosed with stage four, non-cell lung cancer. In 2014, her children were six and eight. Six and eight. She is still alive. She got to take her, to help her daughter finalize her, her matric. She got to send her son to university all because of innovation. And my heart breaks because you know what? There are South Africans in South Africa that do not have access to this. When a South African is diagnosed, especially in the state sector with the stage four, and we know that the most of South Africans that are diagnosed with lung cancer in South Africa are diagnosed with in late stage, in advanced stage disease. Those patients are not given this opportunity to live. Those patients are not given the opportunity to see their children grow up, to see the, the matric dance, to see the wedding. They're not given that opportunity. And that makes me sad. Every time I look at my friend, I think to myself, I wish I could give that to South Africans. And that's why we're here today, because we need to make sure that every South African has the opportunity. So the value of medicine shouldn't be, value, um, shouldn't be measured alone. It's the benefit it brings to the individuals and the patients and to society. And I think that is the society. Value does not equal price and price doesn't equal value. And that's something that we need to, that's our line in the sand as patients that we need to walk past. But it's a line in the sand that a few other stakeholders in the room need to walk past and, and, and wipe out. So with that, I'm going to ask our first um, um, session chair, Hannes from Deloitte to come and join us. And we're going to have a rapid fire session on some of the issues on thing. Thanks, Hannes. Hi, everyone. Um, I think every day comes with its line of surprises. Um, today is, is no different. Uh, I, I came to participate in the discussion um, and I find myself up here now uh, chairing the first session. So welcome everybody. Um, with having said that, I think uh, the discussion should focus on, on access issues, uh, like we say, access dialogue and, and the start of conversation. I'm not gonna go into deep dive uh, personal bios for all the all the panelists. I think for the people in the room, we probably know them pretty well by now. Um, and they've all staked their claim uh, in different forums and discussions uh, as we go. So um, with that, I, I just wanna open the session and you, you can see on the screen um, what, what Kelly and uh, Lauren have, have asked uh, the different panelists to prepare or just think about and, and reflect on are these couple of points here. So what are the factors currently inhibiting access to innovative medicines in South Africa? 
will these factors still play an inhibiting role in accessing innovative medicines in South Africa when NHI is implemented? And what could be done now in the run-up to NHI and beyond to solve for these issues? So I think it's a very interesting and very valuable conversation to have. And I think when you have a group of people together, like what they've arranged here today, it, it opens up a new line of thinking and it challenges each other's um, uh, position of where you are and how you think about access issues. Um, and I think that is important. That's what we want to open up uh, for today. So with having said that all, I want to welcome Kelly back to the front uh, to, to open up the conversation um, on this first topic, each of the panelists will have a, a short burst, I think five to 10 minutes in terms of discussing, uh, reflecting on these different points. So Kelly, uh, Kelly, CEO of Rare Disease uh, Africa, South Africa, please welcome back uh, to stage. Are you? Can I just skip another step? <laughs> uh, we can. It's your day. So, so thank you for that. And, <laughs> and, and with that, another person is now being placed on the spot. Nolatandu, um, you're up. Uh, and, uh, and we welcome you to the stay, stage. Nolatandu is a Chief Clinical Officer at Discovery Health with, with many years as a medical doctor within the life science and healthcare industry. Welcome, Nolatandu. Looking forward to your, to your discussion points. You can come to the front. Why did you allow her to get away with that? <laughs> it is fascinating. So good morning, everyone. And once again, thank you so much uh, for allowing me the opportunity to come and, and, and speak. It's always interesting because uh, I see many familiar faces. So it does feel like a conversation among friends. And uh, I think we've been having these conversations for quite some time. So I think addressing this um, issue around what are the factors that in inhibit access, I think we've been speaking about this for a, a very long time. From a funder point of view, it's really about access. Uh, it's really about affordability and sustainability of, of, of whether it's a scheme. And I think when NHI comes, it's really about making sure that you can sustain funding, even from a government point of view. And I think um, it's quite important that uh, Lauren spoke about value. Right now, when we think about access, we're thinking about access more broadly, whether something has got value or no, or no value. What we see from a funding point of view is that most times we get high cost interventions coming at low value. But the expectation is that from the consumer, the patient, that the funder must fund. What we also don't take into consideration in that funding requirement is that there is already stuff in the base. So it's not like you're removing anything. You are actually adding on. So with that addition of high cost interventions, it means the system can never be sustainable. The one actually, the stakeholder that's missing in the room today are the doctors, the people who are prescribing the drugs. Where are they? Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to be looking at, at him as I speak. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to think about the dialogues that really include all stakeholders. We've got the prescriber. We've got the patient. We've got the funder. We've got the pharma, medical device companies, whoever else is bringing the interventions or innovations. The other important question that we need to address when we think about access is really what is true innovation? Because what we're seeing also is that there's an influx of interventions, medicines, medical devices, like I'm saying, where it's low value, but the claim um, comes with a very high uh, price tag and there's an expectation for funding. So what then should we be looking at? And I think that's where the role of HDA can never be underestimated. Because where you've got a limited pot of money, which government is going to have, I think there is no funder with an unlimited uh, access to money. And I think all of us here, we are potentially members of a, a medical scheme. We contribute to that pot of money. It is limited, but the demands in terms of funding are continuing to increase, resulting in increased pressure on the system. 
So what does HTA then have to offer? HTA allows us to be able to identify interventions that really are going to provide value. It is not about just the price of the, of the intervention. It can be costly, but if it really moves the needle in terms of patient outcomes, that is the intervention where you should be putting your money in. But right now, the competition is with everything on the table. And the demand from a patient who is paying a premium is that you will pay for everything. Similarly, when we get to NHI, I mean, people think as NHI is this unlimited pot of money where you're just going to walk in and you're going to have access to everything. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. There is still the limitation around affordability and making sure that you can sustain your access. So I think the role of NHI, therefore, is critical in understanding exactly which interventions are going to be uh, meaningful. But even with, NA, even with HTA, once you have that output, so because you will start with your clinical evaluation where you assess for value, then you will have to do the economic analysis to actually see if you are going to be able to fund for that intervention, which is why in most instances, yes, there will be clinical data that is provided, but you will look for the cohort of patients who are most likely to benefit the most from that intervention so that you can channel your funding to the patients who are going to benefit the most. And I think that's very important. And I think even in the NHI space, it's not like, you know, you're going to go through an, NH, uh, an HTA process and voila, because uh, the, there's clinical data that shows that something works, that now it's going to be open access. And um, when we speak about cost uh, in our environment, we not only talk about price, it's price plus utilization. What people don't usually understand. So you've got a, 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 an intervention, it costs 500 rand. Versus another intervention that costs 6 million because we get those. Um, 6 million for five patients versus 500 rand for a million patients. So it's important to understand the population size that is going to be using that intervention because the budget impact is going to be determined by the utilization of that intervention and then the pricing, even if it looks as an individual, if you look at the single uh, price of that item, it looks low. But if the population that's going to be using that uh, you know, intervention is going to be a lot of people, then the cost impact is going to be quite significant. So those are some of the, of the considerations that are important. But then what do we need to be doing? I think in South Africa, we are sitting in a very tricky space and we've been having these conversations around regulatory uh, limitations, around what we can do to innovate around access. Because if you know that you want to be providing, providing care for a broader range of people, you need to have creative ways of doing that. Yes, you will have your HTA that determines what you know, uh, interventions you need to be prioritizing. But once you get to that place, how do you then create a structure that allows you to reimburse for value? And I think uh, we've been discussing for a very long time around alternative reimbursement models, where you start focusing on outcomes, where you pay a premium for better outcomes. And where there are no good outcomes, then there is a risk sharing agreement that you have with whoever is uh, providing uh, for that intervention. So I think um, I would be very interested to actually get the thoughts and the discussion going today around how we move forward, because we've been discussing and talking for many, many years around the same issues, but we are not in a position to say today that we have actually moved forward. We have moved forward with a few individuals and uh, some entities that are forward thinking, are creative, but creativity does not necessarily exist across the board. And without that creativity, we are not going to move forward because most of the engagements are still limited uh, to what we know, our status quo, um, and you know some of the barriers that we understand um, are, are, are existing in our space. But I think we have to be creative. And, and I think when we think about the conversations that we're having, yes, we work for various entities, but we must think about the patient because the patient becomes that beneficiary. And I think always I speak to our teams that 
Yes, you sit on the other side and you're making the decisions. One day you will be the patient and you'll be on the receiving end. So whatever decision we're making, yes, we're making for the broader population, but we will also be beneficiaries of those same decisions that we make, which is why I think we cannot sit back and not do anything, which is why we are here today. I think all of us, we woke up because we are committed to actually seeing a difference in uh, providing access, affordable access and sustainable access for that matter. Thank you. Thank you, Nolly. Um, thank you very much. And I think uh, a couple of very valid points. And I think interesting that uh, uh, some, th some of the things that we'll be discussing as we, we go on in the day, but uh, uh, very importantly, point you mentioned in terms of it has to be sustainable, the, the importance of HDA in that environment, um, and then in, a, in kind of an, in a stepwise approach, and then thinking about innovating around arms or risk sharing type of models. So all of those different things Hopefully that will be discussed further in more depth uh, today. Thank you very much, Dr. Leonard Tandu. Then the next um, the next um, panelist we have on the agenda today uh, is joining us online. Uh, Khadija uh, Jam Luden uh, is the Chief Director, Sector Wide Procurement, National Department of Health, and have been the Director for Affordable Medicines Directorate for since 2014. Uh, Khadija, very welcome. Uh, can you? give us an indication are you online yes thank you can you hear us and you're welcome to share your thoughts with the group thank you okay and thank you very much um and i think a special thank you to kelly and lauren for sharing your personal stories i think all of us have our own personal stories about friends and families uh family members who have uh, uh or have had conditions that are very difficult to treat because they are not as common um, and also thank you to Nolutandu for, for raising some of the points. Um, I think on some points we would be in alignment, but in others we just have to have a, a more in-depth conversation. Um, yes, as, as part of the this essential medicine uh, list and the essential drugs program, we do look at affordability and sustainability. Um, and, you know, if we look at what, what a rare disease is in terms of defi definitions, um, you know, they are by their nature very rare and because of that um, the data to support whatever interventions are going to be used would be difficult to to gather over a short period of time with, compared to conditions that are more more prevalent um, and that's why those conditions then become very difficult to treat and because the the costs of the interventions would be so high but you don't get the economies of scale uh, it, it then just exacerbates the, the, the situation um, and therefore, you, you cannot make a one-size-fits-all recommendation for rare conditions. There are some rare conditions. I know the Rare Disease Society considers, um, you know, one in 15 South Africans that being affected by a rare condition. But there are some rare conditions that we have included in the standard treatment guidelines and the essential medicines list. For example, hemophilia. And for other conditions, then we have to look at, um, you know, for example, uh, pseudonyms chorea, for example. Uh, we, we, we have to look at a, an alternative way of dealing with that. Uh, yes, we do ascribe to the HTA methodology, looking at evidence-based medicines and, and looking at the value that you get out of that particular intervention. And I agree, uh, you know, you can't always be looking at price. However, we have to, in, in the context of NHI, we just have to place this correctly. If you look at the NHI bill, right, section seven of the NHI bill deals with central hospitals. Given that these conditions, by their nature being rare, and by, by, uh, by you know, as a consequence, there's difficult, um, you know, to interpret evidence because of the paucity of evidence, they should be placed at research or, or these patients should be treated at research institutions such as your central hospitals. Coming back to the NHI bill, the central hospitals, will be a national government component in terms of the Public Service Act, and therefore they would not necessarily be treated within the NHI context. Um, so they will not be, uh, those conditions would not be reimbursed by the NHI fund per se, because that kind of administration and governance around the central hospitals will be managed by the National Department of Health. So I think the discussion about where do where does rare conditions fit in NHI, I think it kind of straddles because 
um, there are some conditions where we would have, uh, uh, you know, uh, benefits uh, packages aligned to the fund for them. But in others, we have to make sure that they're treated at the appropriate level of care. And those uh, those institutions, such as the central hospitals, must then look at how they, they do the funding to manage those conditions. And in that way, as part of a research organization, we can gather the data we need to make better uh, better recommendations down the line. Um, and just to agree with uh, with um, with Nolutandu, we do look at sustainability. Um, and and um, what we need to also look at is how do we make it possible down the line, even in even without NHI, because I don't think uh, rare conditions is just a, an NHI discussion. But even outside of NHI, what do we need to do? Um, and this we need to just consider in the context of our reduced budgets, just to let you know that the health budget has been cut by a billion rand already. Um, so that makes our jobs harder. We've got to decide which conditions do we treat, which services do we scale down on, or rather where do we get efficiencies? And, and the way we've been dealing with it is, is looking at mids and pricing. And for those um, very common conditions, high volume items such as your first line IRBs, we manage to, uh, you know, to, to achieve a lot of efficiencies. And how do we then translate that gain to manage these difficult to treat high cost conditions um, in the public sector. So those are the kind of things we not, must look at. Uh, so for example, centralize, centralizing the budgets for funding for that. Uh, yes, we would look at partnerships and how that would work, uh, but there are other in, incentives that we should also be looking at um, to, to, to make access uh, you know, achievable and sustainable down the line. Um, thank you. I think I will stop there um, and over to you. Thank you, Khadija. Appreciate that perspective. Um, I think affordability, sustainability is key. Uh, national health insurance, yes, um, we, we take your views. And I think one of the key things uh, we, we realize that you mentioned is centralizing budget, centralizing hospitals, especially when it comes to rare disease. We might be needing to think about alternative options of leveraging or freeing up resources in a resource-constrained environment from a healthcare perspective, therefore allowing funds to be um, allocated toward that centralized budgets for, for rare diseases or other um, uh, uh, disease areas. I think a couple of key points. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective. Um, the next speaker also joins us uh, online. Um, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Andy Gray, or Andy Gray, uh, who is a senior senior lecturer lecturer from pharmacology um, department in University of KZN. Andy, welcome. We look forward to to your perspectives on the topic for today. Thanks very much, and <clears throat> good morning, everyone. I want to start by echoing the point that Nolutandu made around value, and some of you might still be under the impression that innovative means better and therefore has value. And I want to draw your attention to an article that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine um, on the 20th of November. This was an assessment of the provenance and clinical benefit of medicines introduced to the French market, so a high income market, between 2008 and 2018. By provenance, they looked at whether that was the commercial sector that developed the medicine. That was around 73% of the new medicines in that sample over 10 years, or academia or academic commercial collaborations responsible for 27%. But the really shocking point looking at their assessment of value was that 77% of the medicines that originated in the commercial industry and 64% of those that originated in academic settings had no added clinical benefit. And I think that really underscores the challenge that we have with so-called innovative medicines. There are, in some rare diseases, real breakthroughs. Um, some of those are going to be extremely um, expensive, even in high-income settings. So gene therapy for sickle cell disease, for example, is going to be almost impossible, even for the richest countries in the world, 
to be able to afford. And yet it has the potential to change the lifespan of a patient with sickle cell disease dramatically. And we see this in South Africa already, where there are interventions that make an enormous difference in Gaucher, for example, um, but where the budget impact of a relatively small number of patients can be absolutely crippling to the budget, even of, of a hospital like Charlotte McLeake. And regardless of whether that is funded through the equitable share or is funded through a top slice to the National Department of Health, the budget impact is going to remain as dramatic. So what are the other barriers that are impacting on, on these high-priced medicines? I think part of the barrier is the rigidity in our current system. So the single exit price in the private sector has constrained our options and yet has delivered some value over, over time. So there is a logic to the single exit price and the non-discriminatory nature of that price, and yet it is constraining our ability, for example, to, to look at alternative reimbursement models. In the public sector, although, as Katija pointed out, there have been efficiencies due to the monopsony power of the public sector, and we'd expect that to be even greater under NHI, we also know that there are limitations. Increasingly, companies are just simply not responding to tenders, and they are waiting for government to come back and attempt to renegotiate. Sometimes if the volumes are big or the political pressure is, is good enough, and we saw that recently with the pricing of bedaquiline, even with a single source supplier, a price cut can be obtained. But for rare diseases and with very, very small numbers of patients, that um, negotiating power is still going to be limited. Looking forward to NHI, one of the changes between the original bill that was tabled in Parliament and the B version of the bill that was passed by the National Assembly and looks likely to be passed by the NCOP tomorrow is the removal of the amendment to the SEP definition. That has left us not with a way forward, but with considerable uncertainty about how pricing for those medicines within the NHI benefit package will be done. But it also leaves us with uncertainty about those medicines that will likely stay outside of the NHI benefit package. And rare diseases are unlikely to be included within the benefit package, at least for two or three decades from now. As that system matures, we might see something akin to the, the cancer drug fund in the UK. So where there's a dominant national health system, our NHI fund, there will still be a need to deal with these small numbers of patients for whom there is an effective treatment. So I think the uncertainty that we still face is, is important. The debates are still going to be there, but I want to end with a more sort of philosophical approach. And it's, it's one that challenges rare diseases as well as um, cancer treatment more broadly. Universal health coverage is about ensuring that the majority of the population or a greater proportion of the population than currently are able to access needed healthcare services without financial um, implications. By its very nature, that is based on a population approach. It's looking for efficiencies. It's looking for the greatest benefit to the greatest number of patients. And it is entirely consistent with the regressive realization um, entrenched in Section 27 of our Constitution. That leaves highly specific treatments and, and patients with rare diseases at a distinct disadvantage. They are always going to be fighting for the scraps in a system that is focused on the majority, not on individuals. 
there are countries in the world that have justiciable rights to all treatment. Um, Argentina, Brazil are good examples, but that has not resulted in good quality access. It has tied up their health systems in litigation. So the way forward for these rare diseases has to be a combination of the regulatory approaches. We don't have an orphan disease provision in our Medicines Act at the moment. We don't have very explicit um, routes to registration for diseases for which there may be um, limited evidence. And we don't have a dedicated funding stream to look after those whose diseases might pose fundamental challenges to the sustainability of a population-based fund. And I want to end with perhaps a flag, a warning flag that's been um, raised recently. We've seen um, a treatment from Vertex Pharmaceuticals for um, cystic fibrosis not being registered in the country, even though the company is expecting to supply. Their argument is that Section 21 provides them with a quicker and easier route to access, but it also allows them to sidestep the single exit price. The response from civil society has been to look for TRIPS flexibilities, for um, a compulsory license for um, that triple combination therapy. It remains to be seen whether South Africa will ever issue a compulsory license. And we still have to keep up the pressure in the whole ecosystem, not only on our regulators, not only on our health financing operations, but also on our Department of Trade, Industry and Competition to bring us the changes to the Patents Act that they have been signaling since 2018. So we need better patentability criteria, better um, patent examination, pre- and post-award um, opposition systems in order to ensure that where there is real innovation, it's recognized, but where there is not real innovation, it does not demand a premium and therefore put pressure on our systems. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for that uh, for that insight. And I think um, you've highlighted quite a few things that we would need to discuss today. Um, I want to just quickly run through a couple of those main points. Firstly, innovation is not always better. Um, so clearly, we need to evaluate innovation closely. It links into your final point around patentability uh, and the criteria of where value is provided and probably links into a strong HTA sector as well. You also mentioned negotiating power, especially when it comes to rare diseases and orphan diseases where volume is not always there. You, you mentioned price uncertainty around SCP and the way that it affects how we can innovate. Um, and hopefully we can, we can talk about some innovation today. Um, and then finally, you mentioned healthcare access from a philosophical uh, uh, approach. It's about providing more healthcare to more citizens um, and then hopefully in doing so, free up some, some opportunity for, for some rare diseases. But it's a hard, a hard road um, to your point. Thank you very much for that. And then um, with that, I want to move on to, to the industry. I want to welcome Zueli Bashman, uh, president uh, of, of IPASA and currently managing director for, for MSD um, uh, in South Africa and Africa. Welcome, Zueli. Looking forward to it. Uh, suppose there is a use for this on. <laughs> Stick it in there. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I was asked to put together a deck by my team, um, and I didn't do so. I I ended up reflecting on on these words, which basically said, "Give us the serenity to accept what we cannot change." the courage to change what we can, and the wisdom to know the difference between the two. And I felt that I didn't need to go beyond this slide because I think it aptly explains the situation that we find ourselves in. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much um, for granting me the opportunity to share with you 
the perspective of the Innovative Pharmaceutical Association of South Africa. For us, there's no greater honor than accepting an invitation from patient organizations to participate in a dialogue of this nature, because it speaks to our core purpose um, and reason for being. And that is to, number one, leverage the power of science and innovation to save lives. But most importantly, and I think there's a speaker that mentioned it earlier, is to ensure that these life-saving innovations are accessed by all people in need. We must accept that conditions like cancer and rare diseases are extremely complicated to understand, let alone treat. We must accept that the pharmaceutical R&D process is protracted, complex, and expensive with no guarantees of success. We must accept that pharmaceutical companies risk billions of their shareholders' dollars to develop new medicines and must recover these costs from relatively few prescriptions, such as the nature of, of rare diseases. So brutal math dictates that these medicines will inevitably be more expensive than what the average patient can afford. Perhaps the most challenging fact to accept is that no standalone country, organization, or individual has the power to make medicines universally affordable in the now. Doing that would require restructuring the entire pharmaceutical industry, completely re-engineering how society finances research and innovation. And let's be realistic that this is not gonna happen anytime soon, and certainly not in time to help the many South Africans living with cancer and rare diseases today. Now, some amongst us may say that South Africa is different. They'd say that we generally punch above our weight and that we did once influence the global HIV market. But I must remind you that South Africa was home to perhaps the largest population of people living with HIV in the world at the time. And this is not the case with cancer and rare diseases. For these diseases, we represent only a fraction of the global market and even if we were to pull all our procurement, for example, through the NHI, we would be too small to exert any meaningful pressure on the global pricing dynamics. We must accept what we cannot change. But more importantly, we, must, we also need the courage to change what we, what we can in order to address the immediate affordability challenges in, for patients in South Africa. The pharmaceutical industry understands that South Africans cannot afford to make the same contribution to the development costs of new medicines, such as wealthier nations. Instead, the industry has developed and proposed numerous alternative access models that are geared at directly responding to the affordability challenges that exist within the country. Through these models, we are able to leverage the principle of social solidarity, something very familiar to all of us as South Africans, thus allowing us to benefit from wealthier countries paying more for medicines than we do. Doing that will require us to fully leverage all available avenues at our disposal. Section 36.2 of the Medicines Act describes exceptions to South Africa's pricing legislation that make it possible for pharmaceutical companies to offer advanced treatments at preferential prices in South Africa without risking the possibility of wealthier countries referencing our access pricing in South Africa. And to be clear, South IPASA supports medicine price transparency and recognizes the contribution SCP has made to improving the affordability of medicines in South Africa. But SCP can also unintentionally block access to new treatments when other countries, particularly wealthier states, have easy access to the preferential prices that are availed in South Africa. When that happens, it negates our ability to subsidize medicine costs for poorer nations. In our view, by using the existing exceptions in the Medicines Act, the NDOH can protect the pharmaceutical company's ability to develop new medicines and make these treatments available at a more affordable price in South Africa and other developing countries. I accept that other stakeholders might interpret Section 36 differently, 
And to that, I would ask them to table another way to make it possible for us to lower prices in South Africa without negatively impacting the pricing dynamics in wealthier nations. Something else that we must also never accept is the assertion that innovative medicines cannot be made available in the public healthcare system. Let me assure you that when our science work, scientists work night and day to discover new treatments, they do it for all people. Many would argue that the reason for the lack of innovation in the public healthcare system is medicine pricing. But I would ask, does the public sector ask for these innovative drugs? I certainly have never been requested um, by anyone in the public sector to provide a proposal on any of our innovative medicines. Furthermore, our procurement policies do not allow for pharmaceutical companies to simply provide offers to government without a request. So I would argue the first thing to do here is for the government to be audacious and ask. As IPASA, I can assure you that we are committed to working with the Department of Health to help it live up to its constitutional duty to progressively realize all South African healthcare rights as the nation's means allow. In our view, this is what it means to change what you can, to use the legal exceptions that we already have to improve the lives that we can right now, to be audacious and ask for what you need and enter into meaningful negotiations to co-create solutions and mechanisms that will extend access to the South African public. These can also be used as a launch pad for closer collaboration that will ultimately lead us to universal health coverage. The NHI holds significant promise to expand in access to innovation by utilizing its national procurement capability to negotiate more affordable prices. But having said that, it will only benefit from this potential if it can manage We need to have the courage to ask the question at the heart of this dialogue. How much longer, How are, much we longer are we willing to wait? Overlooking the needs, overlooking of, the patients needs of patients in the now, in the now in anticipation, anticipation of systematic, of systematic changes, changes that will happen, that will happen in, the in the future. Do we, do we allow, all, allow patients all patients to suffer because we cannot save every one of them now? Do we blindly hold on to ideological positions and narrow interpretation of legislation in the face of carnage, or should we dare to try a different approach? Do you have the stomach to have academic debates about health equity in the face of a dying parent or a child who would otherwise survive had we dared to try? I certainly don't. So as you split into your breakup groups, please ponder on this. Give us the serenity to accept what we cannot change. We cannot change the impact of global price referencing on farmers' ability to offer access pricing in SA. That is a challenge for government and the WHO to address. Give us the courage to change what we can. We can separate ourselves from previously held ideological positions and adopt a more dynamic approach to the interpretation of existing legislation to benefit those with unmet need. Let us leverage the collective wisdom in this room to co-create and co-implement the solutions that we currently have in order to save lives now, whilst simultaneously preparing for a future under the NHI where all South Africans can experience the progressive realization of their healthcare rights. Thank you. Thank you, Zueli. Uh, thank you. Appreciate those words. Uh, very 
eloquently spoken as always. A couple of key words that stood out for me as well. Um, and I think uh, I want to start with courage to change what we can. Very often we are caught in what we can't. Um, and I think what we can is where we need to focus now to work together. Um, other words that stood out, net visible pricing um, and the impact it has, unsolicited bids and the, the opportunity that could create be created. And then very importantly, and why we here is co-create, co-implement as, as an outcome or, or, or focus. Uh, thank you very much for, for that perspective, really. Finally, in terms of session one, we, we do get to get the prescriber perspective. Um, uh, thank you very much. I want to uh, uh, welcome Dr. McClengin Kube, Head of Health Policy and Research for South African Medical Association. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're very excited as summer to be here. Uh, mainly because um, we do we we do believe in making sure that um, all patients have access to health. Um, so I'll speak to you today about you know looking at um, a proactive approach to to improving access to innovative medicines. Um, but I'll start off maybe with looking at uh, at summer who we are. Uh, I'm using slides. Good. Oh, good night. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So, uh, so today I'll talk to you about. Um, I'll give you an overview of summer. Um, I'll also look at um, the role that doctors play in the healthcare sector, um, the challenges that we face when uh, when innovative medicines are to be prescribed, as well as um, solutions you know that we we may have uh, through summer. And and lastly, of course, we do have a conference that uh, I'll spend you know half a half a minute talking about. Um, so in terms of summer, we we really are almost a hundred years now, and have uh, sixty percent of the doctors being part, being our members. Um, we do also have um, quite a number of publications that we've we we have um, which we do are happy when when you publish in. Um, so <laughs> So um so and and what we really do is we we support doctors you know throughout um you know the their professional um activities uh and in in that we we are very much involved in policy and uh, and legislative um advocacy um we do we we have so many doctors um different disciplines uh within our organization we also have quite a number of MOUs with different um uh, organizations uh, that doctors belong to we we also have a, a global impact uh, through the World Medical Association, um, uh, which we are part of, and uh, this year we'll be hosting the Declaration of Helsinki reviews um, that will be held in, in Santin next year, February. Um, so, in terms of uh, doctors and the healthcare system, uh, doctors do have um, you know participate in several activities. Uh, they range from research. So we have some doctors, won't mention others in the room who are professors in medicine. Um, and, <laughs> and they do lots of work in ensuring that, you know, the, the uh, clinical, the clinical space uh, uh, develops. Um, and uh, there's also issues of doctors as patients, uh, and as well as relatives to patients. I mean, uh, my personal story is I spent, you know, the better half of this year, you know, trying to help an uncle with pancreatic cancer, only to spend, you know, the last few months also, you know, assisting my mom, who also had been diagnosed with a cancer. So in our profession, we we also become patients and our relatives also become patients. So we tend to look at things not only from a professional uh, clinical perspective, but also from the patient perspective, the patient also being us. And, you know, as I mentioned, running around, you know, trying to assist people, it means we also need to navigate complex healthcare systems in order to assist ourselves and in order to assist the patients. And, um, and it's through these activities that we see the value in value-based healthcare. So one of the um, of the policies that we really are working on within summer is really looking at how do we um, develop value-based healthcare in the country from a clinical perspective, and that gives us um, you know and and all this gives us a strategic advantage when dealing with patient issues. 
because um, the doctors are able to look at patients from um, a clinical perspective, but as well as from a patient perspective. And we also are able to, to build the kind of trust between the different stakeholders, you know, be it patients, be it funders, be it the pharmaceutical industry, um, because of the different roles that we are able to play and um, the different groups that we will become part of. And so, but in when when it comes to innovative uh, drugs, there is um, challenges that we face in prescribing. And uh, the first one really is limited clinical data. As, as mentioned earlier, um, we do look a lot into value. And in order for us to be able to derive the value, we need the clinical data. And then the clinical data are there. And what we then need beyond that is, um, is education and training uh, regarding you know, the different new discoveries that are being made uh, with respect to diseases, as well as with respect to interventions for diseases. Um, there's also issues, of course, of, um, of change management, which, which I think are very universal, um, where you know, innovation can be shunned upon uh, for whatever reason, you know, be it, you know, this has always worked or previous experiences have shown me that or have shown whatsoever that, you know, um, innovative drugs might not be as useful, some will say. Um, and and those are issues that um, we do we do face and, uh, you know, and different doctors do face. And then there's issues of medical schemes coverage, which I think has been uh, spoken a lot about, as well as cost and accessibility. Uh, and when one thing, and this is where Lauren really comes in, is the um, administrative burden of appeals, you know, where um, several times doctors do try to prescribe and then, um, you know, the, the, prescri the prescription is declined and they have to appeal. However, when you look at it, and in, it's in both sectors, when you look at it in the public sector, there is often... Um, you know, the, the doctors in the public sector, are, you know, have a very high patient load. And so the ability for them to then step out and focus on a single patient to appeal becomes daunting. Um, at the same time, even those in the private sector, most of them are dually employed. And so the ability again to juggle, you know, the public sector and the private sector and then get out and do appeals, you know, becomes a daunting task. And um, we're grateful that we do have uh, patient advocacy groups that assist um, in that regard. Um, so we won't dwell too much on the problems and then try to look at what can SAMA do or how can SAMA help out in terms of um, addressing these challenges. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll really look at the first two together, which is uh, looking at real world evidence programs as well as continuous uh, medical education. So um, one of the things that summer that we are able to do it as summer is to provide a platform in which information uh, clean, information can be shared with doctors. So uh, when new drugs come up, um, when there's new discoveries, new concerns, we are able to provide that platform through our our webinars, where you know different stakeholders can come through and explain the different um, constituent, the activities and the different constituencies that, um, that they belong to. So for example, um, when there's challenges regarding um, affordability of, of, um, of certain innovative uh, products, it is important and we, we do offer that platform for the medical schemes uh, to be able to come through and say, look, this is what we're actually experiencing when it comes to claims. And these are the challenges that we are, that we currently are facing, and we'll be able to then discuss um, with the doctors. Uh, often our webinars are very interactive, so you'll be able to discuss, explain, share, hear the perspective um, of the clinician. And uh, often when that happens, when we have those, um, we do have CPD points that are associated with that. So it is. Uh, an integral part of medical education. And I believe, you know, with, with that kind of understanding um, and with those kind of engagements, we will be able to, you know, at least deal with conflict issues where, you know, the doctors don't understand the perspective of, um, of the medical schemes or, the, or where pharma is coming from, um, or, you know, the, in terms of value, uh, as well as, you know, what the clinicians really hope for, for their patients. Um, and then there's affordability initiatives, 
Um, I think those have been touched on the ARMs, um, which which summer is also part of this deco. Um, and uh, we've spoken, I think, as well, it did speak about, you know, some some sort of uh, reforms in pharma um, and the medical schemes, as well as, you know, the state needs to be proactive in the in um, in 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 coverage of of um, innovative medicines. So I, I I mean, several times we will say, um, you know, we are doing something or certain things are difficult, but I think uh, it's when it comes to saving lives you know one life lost is a life too many and so uh we do need to you know find ways or at least make a way if there's if if we can't find any to make sure that um we do we are proactive and we don't lose our patients you know due to uh administrative processes that stretch for a long time um yeah and then there's also what we are able to participate in as summer is also looking at um, ethical guidelines and uh, working through our committees to ensure that when innovative uh, products are being given to patients, um, it is done from an ethical perspective. You know, the risk is adequately assessed and that um, at, at all times, uh, the patient, uh, the risk to the patient is, is very much um, minimized. So um, in summary, Uh, the education part uh, and and engagement uh, aspects of access to knowledge ensure that um, we do get there and uh, and as well as you know when it comes to the ethics behind it and then as for the reforms uh, we do have the the different players. Uh, the medical schemes, the pharma, pharmaceutical industry, as well as National Department of Health, um, and even in those activities, we are happy to be part of the of the engagements and to work together to ensure that um, there is improved access to innovative medicines. Um, the last slide really will be everything that we're talking about <laughs> um, will also be present in the summer conference, and so we do invite you all to to join us at the summer conference. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mukhlengi. Thank you very much for, for that perspective. I think uh, what is what is important to me is, is understanding and what's come across is understanding where you can add a value and where you can uh, provide a service or, or, or perspective. And I think that's important for everybody contributing from their base of knowledge. Um, Sama, uh, in terms of value-based healthcare, clinical perspective, as well as the patient perspective, um, to me, what I heard also is ethical guidelines uh, and approval, and I think uh, that's key. And it's, I think it's more difficult than what we realize because you mentioned we want to save every person, um, yet we need to keep certain components and aspects in, in, in consideration as well. So thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists, uh, panelists that, that participated in this first session. Kelly, um, there's, I think there's questions that came in online. Do you want to address them now or do you want Break. So I'm going to, if I can, now that I, I, the reason, <laughs> the reason I asked to move to the end was just because I was trying to get the online discussion up and running. Um, so just in from a patient perspective, I want to say something, and I, I get in, hugely grateful every time someone mentions rare diseases, but I also, you know, in in line with there's quite cancer policies. And yet we still don't have great access for many of the cancers. There's dedicated the budget for cancers and we're not accessing what we should be there. Um, you know, so I think whilst we acknowledge from a rare disease perspective that a lot of those things remain a hindrance and we are much further behind in terms of development from an advocacy perspective in that regard, it's not to say that it's great even when those things are in place. I also want to mention, and I think Sweli mentioned HIV. HIV was also rare ones. There was a time where HIV had very little, there was very little known about it. And when a treatment did become available, there was this thing, it's unaffordable. And yet look at us now. That has come from everyone standing together, lobbying together, working towards finding a joint solution. 
we can, with the same attitude, we can do this for innovation. When we talk about <clears throat> the cost of these treatments and these interventions, we need to acknowledge that there's a cost to no care as well. And we are simply, as government, if you step back from the various industries and departments and business units, and you look back from a government perspective, we are still paying for these patients. The difference is how we're paying for them and whether we are getting the bang for our buck um, in paying for them on social services, in terms of social grants, et cetera, in paying, taking the reduction of the caregiver, the primary caregiver that has now stepped away from producing and being part of the GDP to now care for this patient. We are paying for them either way. Should we not pay that little bit more for more value to see improvement? In the rare disease space, we are often limited in terms of choice. We would love, I certainly would love to not have to give up every second Sunday doing an infusion for my son. I would love to be able to walk into the local pharmacy, grab some tablets. That is not an option for us. This was the, and still is, the only option that we have available to us. <clears throat> For many of the rare disease patients, <clears throat> as well as the cancers, treatments that are being developed as we go, um, we are still living, hoping for the next best thing. And it's so, I've never forgotten, and no, let me not go there. It, it will be too controversial. It's early. <clears throat> but, you know, understanding that also when there's a prescripted product that is declined, from a clinician's perspective, they, feels they, they feel their hands are tied. And what then happens is that the patient gets offered nothing. And we often say, no, that shouldn't be the case. Nolu referred to the base, that there's a base that an innovation builds onto that base. I can assure you that that base is often not implemented as a result of this notion that we cannot treat the problem and therefore there's nothing that can be done for that patient. There is always something that can be done. Innovation doesn't always have to come at high price. Innovation, this, having a conversation with some of us online, that's innovation. And we should embrace it and move away from this understanding that it always equates to something expensive. I also want to refer back to the COVID times, because I think if ever there was a time that we could identify with the lives and the journey that some of our patients go through, it's come from COVID. So one, you had the issue of isolation. We were all stuck at home, losing our minds, realizing you didn't actually love your spouse as much as you sure thought you did. You had the issue of stigma. You didn't want to tell anyone you'd been di diagnosed with COVID because you didn't know how people were going to react. We live with that all the time. Red disease patients are faced with that every single day. You had the fear. Like, will this thing that I cannot see, that I cannot identify, that I don't quite understand, will it kill me? Will it kill my grandparents? Is it going to impact the, love, the loved ones that I have living at home? You had the economic impact. All of a sudden now, some of us were out of work. Uh, salaries were being cut, job losses, retrenchments, all of those things. We, we lived with that fear. You had the issue in terms of financing. We sat desperate waiting for a treatment. Everyone said, will we get a vaccination? Like, is it going to happen? Yes, we got a vaccination. Oh, we live in Africa. We're not going to get it. And then to find out months later that we've paid much higher pricing than what they did overseas, even though we were being told they were doing us a favor. All of those things, this is what rare disease patients live with on a day-to-day -day basis. The discrimination, those things happen to us all the time. But we can address those things. We saw it. We did it with COVID. We've done it with HIV. It just requires all of us working towards understanding that we're working towards an improved solution. And we don't, we never will anticipate that we will get everything we want in one go. We understand that that process is going to be slow and that we are going to need to build on it. But folks, we've got to start moving somewhere. We've been stuck in the same place now for as long as I can remember. We have got to start moving forward. And then I just wanted to touch because um, Prof. Gray spoke about the patents. And I was actually asked recently to speak on this issue at BioAfrica. And I wrote this article shortly afterwards. Um, <clears throat> so 
I listened intently then to all the issues that were raised by colleagues and other speakers with regards to the process of evaluation and submission, compulsory versus voluntary licensing, and the lots of legal jargon interpretation that went over the top of my head. But what was evident was that there's very little known or understood in the sector about the impact to patients on the ground. And whilst patents to protect IP are needed, the balance between profit and accessibility remains a fine line. What is the context of IP for patients? Well, we all have the incredible power of innovation in medicine. It's the driving force behind breakthroughs that transform and often save lives. However, this progress often comes at a price, one that directly affects patients. Patients, I'll remind you, are the ones paying with their lives, not profits. Intellectual property, primarily in the form of patents, play a pivotal role in pharmaceuticals. It grants companies exclusive rights to their discoveries for a limited time, allowing them to recoup their research and development investments. This incentivizes the development of innovation drugs and therapies that alleviate suffering. Yet this very system that fosters innovation can also create a substantial challenge for patients. One, access to affordable medications. High drug prices are a reality that many patients face daily. When pharmaceutical companies secure patents, they have a monopoly on these medications, which often leads to exorbitant pricing. This makes it difficult and sometimes impossible for patients to afford the treatments they desperately need. Health inequities. Intellectual property doesn't affect everyone equally. It deepens health disparities as those with limited financial means are disproportionately impacted. Access to groundbreaking medicine should not be determined by one's socioeconomic status. Delayed access. It takes time for these new drugs to become available for patients, and it can be a lengthy process due to patent protection. Patients facing life-threatening conditions don't always have the luxury of waiting for years for the new medication to reach the market or for the generic to become available. However, it's important to emphasize that intellectual property isn't the sole villain in the story. It's a necessary element in encouraging innovation. Pharmaceutical companies invest billions in research and development, and they need to promote the promise, they need the promise of profit to justify these investments. So where do we find the balance? <clears throat> we must explore alter alternative models that incentivize innovation without compromising access. Governments can play a more active role in price negotiations, and we can advocate for patent reforms that allow generic versions of drugs to enter market sooner. Additionally, increased transparency in drug pricing can empower patients to make informed decisions about their health care. And less collectively, we can influence policies and industry practices. In conclusion, the impact of intellectual property within pharmaceuticals is a complex issue one that directly impacts patients like you and me. While innovation remains paramount, it's crucial that we work towards a future where breakthrough treatments are not only developed, but are also accessible to those who need them. It's a challenge worth pursuing, and together we can make progress towards a healthy and more equitable world. And then I ended with this quote, owning the intellect property is like owning land. You need to keep investing in it again and again and again to get a payoff. You cannot simply sit back and collect rent. So with having said that, I want to ask the question, do we sit here today merely as colleagues or as collectives willing to work on changing the narrative that we have on the ground today? Thanks. Thank you, everyone. We're going to break for some tea. Um, if we can be back at, um, at uh, 10 to 10. Sorry, my eyes are, yeah, 10 to 10. Um, we can, we'll be back at 10 to 10, and then we're going to look at session two. Um, thank you very much.
other way around. Ah, it's not worth it. Maybe it's not on. Let's check. Okay. Why you guys ask me to? Where is the slides? You'll tell me when to put your slides. Do you want your slides? Now? I want your slides. Now. Okay, yeah, put my slides now. Oh, hey, 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 It's far away. Good morning. Am I loud enough? Am I audible? Okay. Uh, welcome back uh, to the second session where we talk about proposing tangible solutions. 
Um, so I was told to facilitate the session by, uh, not asked, I was told. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those that don't know me, ah, that's a few people in the room maybe. Uh, I'm Fakir Chavus. I uh, work at Estelas, a uh, pharmaceutical company, and uh, I also sit on the IPASA patient access working group and on the pharmaceutical task group, also working on patient access. Um, so I took advantage of the platform to put together a few guiding slides. Uh, and we're looking at access to innovation in innovative uh, medicines, EML medicines and vaccines. And, uh, and the question is who needs access? And I heard lots of discussions about SEP and alternative reimbursement models, uh, but uh, we live in the most unequal kind of times magazine. So from Makosi to Primrose, from Alex to Santon, all patients need access. And I think uh, Kelly said it here, we should all be collective advocates to try and get access for patients for uh, oncology medicines and rare diseases. So if you look at it, uh, at how many patients there are in the public sector, there's 85% of the population is accessing care in the public sector and only 15% in the private sector. Many of the rare disease medicines, the oncology medicines are accessible in only a half of the private sector population. So we're looking at seven and a half percent of people. So basically we need access right from the desert to the sea. <laughs> <laughs> I had to bring that in. <laughs> so uh, now we shouldn't say we haven't done anything. So there's something called an access to medicines uh, foundation. And this foundation is an independent nonprofit organization that looks to transform the healthcare ecosystem and mobilizing companies to expand access to es essential medicines in low and middle income countries. So they produce this report every two years. In the 2022 report, if you go and look at what has happened in South Africa, uh, voluntary licensing. There's been a first one for cancer in South Africa, well done to Novartis. Uh, technology transfers, equitable pricing strategies, again, Novartis with the emerging market brands, Nari. Uh, however, uh, emerging market brands are now uh, at emails, you won't see many of them coming through anymore. So emerging market brands up a lower price with a different name. Basically. I'm for charges a large co-payment. I'm looking for <laughs> Uh, okay, so we uh, we also have we had an access to care program in the public sector, uh, and it measures the patients served, uh, the children served, population health outcomes as well, and then there's donations. There's quite a few donations happening into the public sector of innovative medicines. So my. My suggestion uh, and my suggestion to the speakers that are coming up uh, is, can we look at both the public and private sector? And also, uh, always have the resources in South Africa to, uh, to evaluate medicines. Uh, I know uh, Nolu was talking about HTAs that Discovery do, but Discovery does their HTAs, Medscheme does theirs, public sector does theirs, and there's many people working on, on HTAs but they are global bodies that do provide evidence for medicines that can be utilized and save our resources. Uh, so for example, you have the World Health Organization EML. There's many cancer medicines on this World Health Organization EML that South Africa subscribes to. 
so for example, uh, there's novel hormonal therapies for prostate cancer. This is commonplace everywhere in the world. In South Africa, we only have chemotherapy, uh, alotinib, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab. All of these are on the, on the EMR. And I've never seen a call, like Zueli said, that I've never seen a call from, from the Department of Health. Can we, can we negotiate on a price for these mutants? We don't see it. So, uh, and I know they've done one for prostate cancer, Department of Health, Khadija still there. They've, there's a policy that's never been implemented. They did look at the novel hormonal therapies, but they never asked the pharmaceutical companies, what price are you willing to give it to us for? Okay, so the second one is the ESMO magnitude of clinical benefit scale for cancer medicines. Uh, this is also a, a nonprofit organization that looks at the clinical benefit for, of cancer medicines that can be used on what to call for in, in the public sector. And then on rare diseases, I found this quite interesting. There's 204 essential medicine products for rare diseases, a uh, recommendation made by a rare disease treatment working group. Uh, it's a starting point. I mean, we as the DOH can start calling for these medicines. Some of them are already on tender, or, but we don't see any of this ha uh, happening from the DOH. There's no push. Okay. Uh, so now uh, we'll go on to the, rep to the, not rapid fire session, but to the tangible solution session. And uh, he's going to do it. And then we call upon our first speaker, who is Belinda. Where's Belinda? <laughs> Representing the patients. We have to put patients first, right? Except, Thank you. except when they ask you a lot. Hi, <laughs> hey, everybody. It's an honor to be here today. Katie asked me to speak and tell um, my sister's story and what happened to us from a cystic fibrosis perspective. So um, you might have heard what's happening in the news lately, and you can thank my sisters for that because my story is similar to Kelly's story, except mine doesn't have a happy ending. I had two sisters. I had two sisters. One passed away at age 32, Jenny, in 2014. Lauren, age 35, recently, last year, 2022. Okay. Now, the bureaucracies uh, surrounding the access to innovative medicines has already been labeled and listed. One, patents. The patent laws are the rare disease community, because that limits our access to cheaper and more affordable generics in the marketplace. Currently, there are treatments available for us, but uh, due to patents, we cannot import them. We physically have to save up fundraise, which is not sustainable for any family, private or public, in 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 those healthcare sectors, it is not a sustainable solution to go via Section 21 and to go and fly out to get a generic. Okay, so my sisters were diagnosed with cystic fibrosis within um, in the early 1990s. So I spent 35 years in and out of hospitals, private and public. Um, uh, so I've got both sides of the spectrum as to what every patient goes through. So I've nursed my sisters. I, I've always joked and said that I've got shares in all the various hospitals within Gauteng. So... Um, uh, that is how I got into this. It wasn't by choice, <laughs> but I did a feasibility case study for uh, motivation for funding when we tried to do the generic exercise to try and get funding or a reimbursement in for one of the treatments for CF, and I was assisting a mommy, and Lozzie's medical bills for uh, 2017 amounted to 2.3 million in hospital stays in ICU. Now, wouldn't that 2.3 million be more um, uh, utilized more effectively uh, by giving the patient a better quality of life instead of putting the burden on the healthcare uh, infrastructure? 
private and public, because with cystic fibrosis, you've got to be in an isolated private room because of the germs. And secondly, lung transplants, organ transplants. Most CF patients going towards the end stages need to um, either have to wait on the organ transplant list. Wouldn't it be beneficial to all stakeholders involved to get these modulated treatments in so that that list is shortened and other patients can access those organs, much needed life-saving organs. So um, in effect, that's basically what I have to say, that the patents, the licensing and the registration, time is not a luxury. My sister got access to the generics by, by one of the, um, she was already at the end stages. Her lung function was merely 15% and we brought it up. She was oxygen dependent. ESCOM, thank you, load shedding, et cetera, et cetera. We were at our wits end. It, it wasn't a good quality of life that my sister was leading. She was unable to work. My parents were dedicated caregivers to her. I paid for a medical aid. So um, that is why I still fight to the state. It really is various parents around the country and also around get access to these medicines and sit and relive that trauma. I've seen things that you people have not seen. I've, I've heard things. I've, I've seen it with my eyes. And um, the stakeholders, and the advocate groups can do much better. We must be better. So, um, yes, that is my story in a nutshell. This woman is very brave. Very, very brave. Thank you, Belinda. Uh, very heart wrenching. Uh, well, so just to take out from there, we need to see how we allocate resources in the public sector uh, so it's appropriate for patients. Um, also, we need to make medicines more accessible. Uh, how we make them accessible is, is important. I think that's why we're here today. Uh, so to continue, I'm going to call Dr. Jacques Neyman from Agility. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> so, you know, you actually need to start with your conflicts of interests. So like some of the cricket players many, many years ago, if you take bribes from all sides, then you're actually neutral. Now, all I want, so uh, let's move on. So yes, I do consult in the medical scheme environment. I do in consult in the pharmaceutical environment. I do own a device company and so forth. So we can say conflicted on all sides. And I'm a board member of Sama. <laughs> Having said that, look at, let's look at, and it's been coming up all the time, alternative reimbursement models. Is it foreign? It's the only way the NHS in the UK operates. That is, there is no other way. We've been paying more for Trastuzumab than the Brits for many, many years because we have not taken up the challenge getting an alternative reimbursement model for that particular product. I can give you other examples, like lenalidomide. It's a tenth of the price in Botswana than what we have to pay in South Africa for it. So our patients just cross the border and they buy their medicines from reputable companies. So this is, what are we doing? So I want to, what has really said, what is there that we cannot change that we just need to let go? And what is there that we can change? Alternative reimbursement is something that we can truly change. So, okay, I suppose if I 
press there, it goes somewhere. No, it's not. Uh, yes, there we go. Okay, so, uh, uh, so sorry. So let's not look at price and 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 what was just said by the previous speaker. Price is what you pay for the medicine. Cost is what's the total cost of care. Now, if I look at the medical schemes, medical schemes look at the cost of care, but they do not look at the cost to society. That's not their mandate. So when you look at the NHI process, NHI needs to look at the cost of the social impact as well, and not only the cost of care. I'm not saying any of this is right. I'm just saying where and what we should be taking cognizance. So cost to society. What is society willing to pay for someone else's disease? And guess what? There's a complete inequality of this. Certain diseases just attracts more money. It's much better to get breast cancer than prostate cancer. It's just people are just willing to pay more for breast cancer than for prostate cancer. And that's a fact. We, we don't have to look at whether there's uh, equality in that. It is a simple fact. So if you then go down to other rare diseases, you don't even find them on the ED, uh, on the prescribed minimum benefit list. They're simply not there. How slow are we in updating that particular list? A right to care. It's your constitutional right to care. If you look at the preamble of the NHI bill, I don't think any one of us can find something wrong with it. The problem is when we look at how it's going to or want to be implemented, we I don't see light. Okay. So what is our duty of care? Whose responsibility is and what is the morally correct thing to do? So differential pricing is a fact. Can't get away with that. Comparative pricing, the cheaper uh, parallel imports or price pressure. We're talking about patents and patents being prohibited. If it wasn't for a patent, you would not have had the medicine at all. So who of you have got Pension funds, contribute to pension fund. Uh, giving the where you sit now, I get 90% of you do. Do you know that 35% of your pension fund is invested in a pharma company? So would you rather withdraw it and put it in something else? I'm just putting it out there. So we with pension funds are supporting pharma to do development so that our pensions become worth more. It's a commercial venture. So how do we make it possible that people then get access to that initiative going forward? All right. So the Act already said provides and we can do it. There's a positive to Act. Alter outcomes determine the price and the fundamentality. And I think this was, what is the outcomes? And I think Andy has shown 70% odd of new innovations has got no benefit over the old. So forget it. Focus on what is really innovative, what we can make a difference in. Look at the cancers. How many melanoma stage four patients would you find in South Africa per year? Less than 500. I talk across the spectrum. Is that an orphan disease? It's not listed as an orphan disease. Metastatic bladder cancer. I can cure it in 50% of patients, but it's going to cost me. A stage four oncology diagnosis is not a PMB, right? The fact that I've suddenly got cure for it doesn't suddenly make it a PMB. So where do we take this? We can only take it forward if we look at how can we do it differently. We need to look at value-based pricing. Referring, and, 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 and we don't have to be inventing the wheel. It's already there. We can just go and crip and copy what is there, okay? We do not have to redo it. So we can set setting value-based requirements, specific markets segments, specific medicine. We, uh, we can look at the willingness to fund environment to take this a little bit forward. So it's easy to do. So we're coming closer to personalized healthcare. The majority of patients taking an antihypertensive today will never benefit from that particular product ever. Okay. Because we're treating what we have studied epidemiologically, which is a good thing to lower the blood pressure. The minority of people will benefit from that, even if they do take the medicine. 
I'm not saying you mustn't take your medicine. I'm just stating simple facts, okay? So if you look at personalized medicine, if I can buy genes determine who will respond it's already out there i can also determine the response rate within a very short period of time i can then say how do i reimburse that and how do i transfer the risk of uncertainty to the innovator or the founder of this particular invention so transparency is important visibility is something we need to discuss and I think that's been said over and over this one. So value-based primacy, value defined clearly. Outcomes-based, risk shares, the offset of uncertainty in the outcome. In, uh, uh, and and, and uh, Italy has got a couple of good examples. So as the bulk of the Eastern European countries, I do not have to look for, and I can find these ways. And it doesn't have to be a single-payer process. Uh, how many... Brits, do you think, in the beginning of this year, took up private insurance because access to healthcare has become a significant problem in the UK? It's up by 25 to 50 percent, right? So what is it? Yes, I can get a hip transplant. It will wait, take me 58 weeks from being diagnosed to getting a hip transplant in the UK. If I'm on the expedited oncology program, from diagnosis to treatment is 18 weeks. Not me. Lang Buston Conference, October 2022. Just Google. It's there. It's open. Uh, open. So you can say, so, so all I'm saying is we can learn from what's already out there how not to do it and how to do it differently. And yes, we may not possibly afford all the medicines that I find in those particular countries, but surely we can get a lot closer to what we are at this point in time. And as we said, we need to look at indication-based pricing. With other words, I can pay differently for the same molecule for different diseases. So if it's a little benefit or little value, why should I pay for it almost at all? So I need to align the incentive to realize the value. So, and it's not me, it's Adrian Tauser of NICE in the Office of Health Economics in the UK that says, a single transparency list price is not the best way to provide access, okay? Now, what it means is when it's visible, okay? Now, everybody knows what the Brits pay for trastuzumab, but it's not officially listed. Therefore, it cannot be used as a reference. And that is the simple way to go. And I think it's something we can do very quickly. So, legislative constraints. Supply and healthcare is for profit business. We know that. I've already discussed it. Budget constraints are real. Outcomes are often elusive and create uncertainty. And that is why we need an alternative reimbursement. To some, I need to transfer that risk. And then, obviously, the higher the number needed to treat, the lower the value of the intervention. Therefore, personalized treatment who requires a single test to find somebody that will benefit is most probably the highest value I can obtain. We have entrenched treatments, which are not very effective, as I pointed out before, but it's because it's so entrenched that we do not mind. So we need to look in the entire treatment range that we have for patients in general. So principle of outcome, patients achieve better health, provider achieve better efficiency, payers control the risk better, and that's irrespective of who that particular payer is. And suppliers align with prices with patient outcome so that there's a sharing in that particular risk going forward. So models that can work in South Africa, immunotherapy, we've already demonstrated how that can work for certain disease areas. Number of potential patients are low, exposure is known. We we are not a pioneering site. We can easily, easily come up with a more suitable solution. So I need to diagnose or di define the patient. I then need to have entry and stop criteria, and I can have a risk settlement criteria. So process is not difficult. Copy this from what's happening in the world. So I've entry, simple like a clinical trial, and I've got stop criteria, simple like in a clinical trial. So the biggest barrier to access is not price, but the willingness to make this work. Thanks for care. Thank you so much, Jacques. 
Uh, Jacques said quite quite a bit of things, so I just want to quickly summarize. Um, we should look at access to high value medicines, not just high cost medicines. Um, he clearly highlighted the difference between transparency and visibility of pricing. Uh, and uh, we don't want our prices visible. Uh, and he highlighted again that SCP disconnects price and value. Um, so uh, we'll be using all, all of Jacques' proposals in our upcoming session. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now to somebody you all know who has moved from the DOH to the private sector. Welcome, Gavin. So in the spirit of Jacques, I'm conflicted 360 degrees. So, <laughs> um, And it's, it was an interesting experience early in my career where I was doing some work in British Columbia and we were doing the whole thing on conflicts of interest. And they asked us in a room, who has con no conflicts of interest? So all of us put our hands up and they said, how many of you are healthcare workers? And we had to put our hands down. And they said, you are conflicted, naturally. So I'm going to most probably make a few controversial comments, which I tend to do. Um, and it's partly to stimulate some debate. And um, as a group, we largely lament and cry into our coffee cup about access to innovative medicines. And I'm going to argue, and I'm going to go, take you through some thinking, is the same group innovative in their thinking around access? We keep on drum going down the same path, expecting different outcomes. And I'm not going to quote a very intelligent man. If you carry on doing the same thing, you're not going to see any tangible difference in outcomes. So I'm going to argue that there's a call to action in this group around being innovative as to how we A, see access and B, think of around solutions. Okay, Having been on the same side, in 1990, uh, the 2005, the same arguments that were coming to me then after the Constitutional Court ruling are still circulating just with a small little bit of window dressing. If it was not successful over those decades, it's unlikely to be successful today as we stand here. So let's talk about access. And um, as I say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You. Your, your understanding and your position on access will differ according to your vantage point. And the prevailing one in the public sector, and look at how I choose my words, is that of the public health mindset. Okay, And without understanding the public health mindset, we are never going to address access to innovative medicines, for example, for rare diseases. There has to be some trade-offs in the public health debate because a public health approach is never going to give you a solution. And we can stand on other ends throwing mud at each other, but if we don't find that common ground, so I will argue that in the using a public health paradigm, there should be an agreement in society that we carve out some money which is left to look after the individuals with rare disease, or else we will never get to it. I'm going to skirt around this one, but having worn the mantle or the cloak of um, misery, of leading the um, human resources for health in this country, okay? Professional politics, and I don't think we can duck it. I don't think we can dive it. Pro professional politics are in their own right accesses to barriers, uh, barriers to access, okay? And um, I remember very, a very interesting debate, and it was 2017, October, and it was around rare diseases. And we met with all the principal officers from the medical schemes. And there was a discussion about 
can we as government at the time give the private sector access to tender pricing? And we liked the idea and we said, okay, well, let's take this one step further and let us agree that um, rather than our academics coming and doing our WAPs in the private sector, let us have a situation where private sector patients come to the academic centers. Khadija said it, okay? So I'm, as I said, conflicted. Worked with her for many years. I corrupted her. Um, <laughs> and that fell through so quickly largely driven by the politics, the professional politics that arose out of that. And then you can go through the various iterations, but I can stand here all day talking about that. And then we have the, the grouping that I've joined now, and Fakir is one of my comrades, and that is the commercial aspects. And we all talk about access, and we have our paradigm of access. Bottom line is, how do we get more sales, okay? Um, it, and, then, and there's no way of cloaking it, no way of sugarcoating it. It is the reality. Okay. Um, and then we have, and, you know, I had a lot more hair when, when I held this perspective. And that I call it the activist role. Okay. And I remember being very, very intrigued at, with a Brazilian group and listening to their approach around patent law and those solutions. 30 years later, I still see no tangible movement. So access has very different dimensions depending on how, which vantage point you look at it. And quite often we will sit in a group like this and there'll be this veneer of common understanding, but deeply entrenched are our different value systems. HTA, we love talking about HTA, and I'm going to be very controversial. South Africans cannot do HTA. Okay? I think the public sector does the best job at it. I'm not saying they're very good, but they do the best job at it. Okay? Um, but HTA is premised on the concept of evidence-based medicine. Okay? And the decision is the sum of, number one, the evidence. And then number two, the value systems. And hence, I was talking about for rare diseases. For that to work, there must be a change in the value. Because as Khadija said, the evidence is not overwhelming. Okay, It's an equation. So we have a long journey to walk in South Africa if we want to... Um, lay claim to implementing HTA. As Jacques was saying, sometimes in life, there's no point in reinventing the wheel and there are international models that we can use. So let's look at the operating system that we all work on, okay? Um, the legislative framework, now remember, Legislation is like an oil tanker. It takes a long time to change, which means that there needs to be planning and consistency. As South Africans, we lack that. And that's why you see no meaningful change in the status quo from a legislative perspective. Remember, you've got to draft the legislation. Drafting in itself is a very complicated process. Then you've got to take it through the entire political framework. And then you've got to do the regulations and, and all of those sort of things. So the legislative changes um, need to happen, but it starts with a very clear perspective. And you can't wish them away. The SEP legislation has been a double-edged sword. And I think we have to acknowledge the massive impact it made from a public health perspective in the diseases, Jacques, sorry to say this, such as hypertension, okay? <laughs> the affordability of antihypertensive medicines in the private sector has come down significantly. 
adopting a generic policy is another public health intervention that has worked very well in South Africa. We, we generally use very close to the Americans, oddly enough, they waste a lot of money, but they're also very efficient in their generic uptake. Um, we do very well in terms of that. So we can't argue that the SEP hasn't achieved some good. Um, I looked recently, it was actually a year, beginning of this year, and I was putting together a slide deck in, for a similar discussion. And what blew me was the evidence that I found, particularly in cancer, whereby because of SEP legislation, Swiss nationals for a basket of nine medicines pay less than private sector South Africans. Okay. So we need to find a solution. I do believe that um, the exemption profile provides that platform. I think because of those different vantage points around access, we fail to find common ground in that solution. And it all revolves around one thing. Okay? None of you over here will volunteer and whisper into my ear your password of your bank account. That would not be rational. No rational human being would do that. Okay. So if you come with an alternative reimbursement model and we can rename it risk sharing, you know, they've I've been through them all <laughs> um, without a solid governance framework, you can go nowhere. And you can't be judge and jury. So the giver, in other words, the manufacturer, can't be the governance framework. The receiver, particularly this divide between administrators and medical schemes, also cannot be the governance framework. So there is that middle. Okay? And conflict of interest. I do, I am involved in a managed care organization, but that is the design of these sort of legislative structures. But as a country, we don't use it. No one's gone to the pricing committee having sat with the Council for Medical Schemes and gone through and said, here's a governance structure that we believe will give you a trustworthy access program. So remember, government is mistrusting of us as a private sector. Private sector believes government is corrupt and useless. Okay, So we all look at each other from opposite ends and no one does anything. But I do believe it's possible. Um, picking up one of the points that Kelly made... Um, In economics, you've got that economies of scale and volumes bring down prices, and we see this in the ARVs and all of those um, beautiful things. But I think functionally, if you look at it very carefully, particularly the multinational companies, and that includes a big bulk of the generic manufacturers in South Africa, they already do central manufacturing offshore. So it's all about can we allow exemptions allow around labeling? So I'm sure many of you in the room, when you're doing price negotiations with a manufacturer, encounter the same problem I do, particularly in cancer, bladder cancer, volumes. There's a mi minimum batch size that you have to purchase. So you either buy the whole batch and then destroy and then redistribute your costs and end up pushing up the price of medicines. So, and I do not believe Section 21 model that's working at the moment is a correct framework because there are people who are abusing that mechanism. And if you look at the prices of medicines charged for Section 21 medicines, they are exorbitant. And I will be controversial. It is downright, downright robbery. Okay, we we can sugarcoat it. We can be nice to colleagues, but that. That is what's happening there in the Section 21 space. So we need to find a mechanism, and potentially that can also work under the current 
piece of legislation with slight changes to the guidelines and the regulations. I'm just quickly going to wrap up. Um, those of you who are older, my generation will have read The Animal Farm. Okay, everyone is equal except for some. Okay, and we've we've spoken about HIV and TB, but an interesting thing, and I remember, if, I don't know if Jock remembers this, but in the late '90s, having a big debate about the management. You know, when we were discussing in, in the Essential Medicines List program, introducing cancer. And there, were, and there were a lot of, there was a lot of pushback. And I remember putting on the table, well, while we manage cardiac failure all the way to the end, and if you look at the costs of managing those cardiac, cardiac failure patients vis-a-vis -vis many of the cancers we have on the table. So, that is part of that ethical dilemma. Once you start treating someone, you have to continue treating them through to the end. So they are, but also Jacques spoke about having nice little rules and exit rules. Um, and HIV and TB. If you dig a little bit deeper, and let, let, let's be, let's celebrate number one, South Africans, as we stand at the moment, have access to world class ARV care. It is cutting edge technology. When the new technology comes out, we are quick to adopt as a country, okay? For all the right reasons, there's nothing wrong with that. The same applies with TB. You heard Andy talking about bedaquiline. If you look at the health economics of XDR TB and the outcomes of that vis-a-vis -vis some of the cancers we talking about over at the moment it is expensive so that's also why i talk about the health the public health paradigm how do you get the cancer agenda into the discourse of public health argument and ncd management um we we also need to, this is my last statement, for you before you start, get worried. <laughs> we also need to look at um, HTA. Um, I think it was in 2006, I brought out Lou Garrison uh, um, to discuss health economics in South Africa. And there was, there was a spark of enthusiasm whereby we as a country would establish a whole lot of health utilities. That has never happened. But there should be a thing of a list of health utilities, which if I'm putting together a health economic model, um, that that then can be utilized as a common good. Okay. The medical schemes need to also adopt what I introduced around clinical trials with the World Health Organization. We created a common review process. Okay. So if there's a clinical trial that is being done in South Africa, Uganda, and Swaziland, we all sit around the table and talk the science. The science remains the same, but because of what I said, evidence-based medicine is the evidence plus values, each country went home and made their own decision. But they benefited from the pooling of the technical brains. We have scarce skills in this country particularly in the oncology field, there's a handful of people who actually understand the technologies and the economics of it. We need to sit around a table. So my view is that there shouldn't be seven different, you know, drug companies around, put up your hands, how many different types of HTAs do you have to submit? There should be one document. Okay. Pricing committee put that document out in 2008. It's never been adopted by the private sector. Okay. Partly because I argued the private sector couldn't use it. Okay. But that's a different debate. Um, so there are multiple solutions if we wear the hat of finding a solution. It's easy to sit around the table and talk about how terrible 
the environment is and all of the constraints. Um, but I honestly believe that there's a multitude of problems, uh, of, of solutions, even around the IP issue. How many of us truly sit and negotiate voluntary licensing? Okay, I'm talking about those who can actually make a difference. How many of us truly do that? Compulsory licensing is a, it's quite an extreme mechanism. And there's no point in jumping from one extreme to the other. In between is voluntary licensing. I do not believe it is used appropriately and correctly in this country. There is the option of second brands. If you don't want visibility, I'm going to use the word it. If you don't want to be stung by visibility, then create a second brand and do a voluntary licensing program with a South African outfit. It cannot be internationally benchmarked. So if that's your problem, there's a solution. It's a very simple one. It's not a nice one. It's not an eloquent one, but there is a solution. So there are multiple. I can go on all day arguing that it, we, the inaction are our different um, vantage points. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, and I see you have a list of uh, solutions there. Can you please bring the list to the next session? Uh, and uh, I agree with Gavin where he says, uh, we, what we need is innovative thinking. And that aligns to Zwelli's, uh, you know, we can change, let's do the things we can, change the things we can. Um, also the voluntary licensing, you'll know that there is now SAPRA's allowing dual applicancy. So I think that's what Gavin is also referring to. So it's another mechanism of improving access. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to the next uh, speaker. It's Anas again. Hi, everyone. Um... I was just speaking to somebody at the break and uh, she mentioned she might walk out early and I was saying, okay, hopefully it's not just because you had too much to hear about me now. Um, and and uh, so I'm going to be much briefer than the previous uh, two speakers. Uh, Jock and Gavin went into a lot of the detail. I think it is important. It is what we want to discuss. But in getting stuck in the detail, I think we're starting to fall behind on the discussion uh, at, a, at a more global, bigger level. Uh, and I think that's what I want to briefly look at. And, and then also, in the spirit of what we want to do, just highlight one potential component or aspect in which we can look not at alternative reimbursement model, but maybe at a way of looking at HTA, um, applying technology, because let's be honest, since the beginning of this year, 2023 has been a blockbuster in terms of the impact technologies have had on healthcare. Uh, I'm thinking about the uh, chat GPT, GPT-4 kind of programs and aspects where we know they can make diagnosis better than doctors in electronic uh, in, in emergency rooms. We know that they are even um, better in sharing that outcomes with the patients than the doctors. Um, so there's many different ways in how we can apply technology. So having, having said that, just look at a couple of things. Now, if we look at health access and how we're going to improve the health for the majority of people in, in an equitable way, we need to look at defining health and defining value. Um, we can't just look at physical health. We have to look at a combination and any time now. We need to look at a combination of notes. And one back, thank you, there we go. Um, we need to look at a combination of the different components all contributing together to a sense of well-being. So it's not just physical, it is mental well-being, social, emotional, physical, spiritual, and financial well-being. And we need to consider that every patient, every funder, every healthcare practitioner, provider goes through this. Uh, and we need to consider all of these components and the social determinants of health that goes along with it. And that's the only way that we can really look at health access 
and impacting not just one or two, but the majority. And in so doing, creating funding space or room to be able to do then the one or two as well. Um, so typically what we look at is clinical objectives, economic objectives, and humanistic objectives. It's all the components that we've been discussing today. And I think we are starting to fall behind on the next conversation is about the environmental objectives. Healthcare industry is, I think it's the fifth largest, um, uh, or certainly, uh, yeah, I think it's the fifth largest, if considered a, a country, contributor to carbon emissions. So if we don't think about doing healthcare differently, we are actually um, uh, doing ourselves a disservice. So we need to solve for these first three quickly because the next discussion is the economic objectives and how do we do healthcare going forward. So, so with that and all of that background, I quickly just want to highlight a case study that uh, that we've we've uh, completed a couple of months ago now, um, using technology, using um, the different skills uh, and assets that's available. We know that sometimes there's a paucity of data. There's not enough information. That the data is not connected, or the data sits with potential uh, specific uh, stakeholders that's not willing to share the information. However, we can apply technology to get to results where we can not look at an existing patient journey, but simulate a patient journey based on all the information using technologies that are at our disposal to then evaluate what is the total cost of care for that patient. So not just the cost of therapy, but the cost, uh, the cost of care for, for that patient. So it is taking the clinical objectives, economic objectives, and humanistic objectives. And for now, we leave the environment, uh, environment uh, environmental objectives for, for another day's discussion. Quickly, just two graphs that I want to show you in terms of what we've seen um, and a bit of the background to um, the, the product that we looked at specifically came at a monthly cost of the product of, of between eight and 10,000 Rand for the product. The baseline therapy or the standard care in, in the South African environment for a product that is frequently, and as a, as a matter of fact, is the most frequently used in that therapeutic area is 63 Rand per month. 60 Rand versus 8,000 Rand per month. Yet, we can see that if you consider all the components of contributing to the cost of that patient, we can see that right at month seven, the green line, which is the new therapy prioritized component, already went lower in terms of monthly costs over five year simulated period compared to that very cheap baseline option. And at month 13, you already broke even in terms of the initial higher cost of drug, which is very significant and uh, is something that's, that's provocative in terms of how we thought of and what is all the discussions we've been having with medical aids in terms of we can't assure membership. We need to break even after a year, otherwise we lose membership and somebody else get the benefit. So we really need to consider what we've got available, applying the technologies in the right way, and then understanding, do we need alternative reimbursement model or do we just need to see how to manage the patient better, utilizing what we already have? And so, and so doing potentially uh, create headroom to treat more patients. So, so then if we look at it from a patient perspective or from a cost perspective, if we consider the blue total cost of therapy over a month uh, using the lowest care uh, cost option, and you consider the standard combined group of, of products being used for the therapeutic area, and you then look at the, at the product we evaluated, that then becomes a area where it's, it's undoubtedly uh, indicative of value because it's lower than even standard care. However, it, um, the medical aids are paying for those higher, uh, lower cost items, but at a higher uh, cost to them and to their bottom line potentially. It, it's not only a burden on funders. It also speaks back to the opportunity we have and pharma has going back to their global um, sponsors and, and, uh, and affiliates to understand and say, look, this is what our environment says we can cost a product at. What is the power of negotiation here? 
there's a bit of information we have. This is South African contextualized information. It's not just the global clinical information, but it looks at cost of care. It looks at available treatment options in the country and different components. So it, it leaves us with that closing thought is, do, does it have to be alternative reimbursement models? Can we use other methods applying technology in combination with searching for alternative reimbursement models and frameworks? And then by so doing, creating space in the meantime. And I think that's just where we want to end off on, on this small section in terms of clinical, economic, and humanistic objectives can come together. And it can create room for patients, so for, for us to be able to treat more patients. And it could be that this methodology is applied in one therapeutic area, freeing up space for management in a different therapeutic area or a, re a rare disease therapeutic area potentially. So just some thought uh, for, for the discussions going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anis, for bringing something, a different perspective to the table. Um, it's quite interesting. Uh, I'd like to look at that model. <laughs> I'm sure many people in this room as well. Um, Next up, we we have somebody not so provocative, <laughs> Prof. Alex. Hi. Good morning. Um, I think if the um issues I'm going to discuss around this um deal with the systemic problems that we're actually facing. And one of the systemic problems we're facing is that we don't have a government at the moment in, in relation to healthcare. So I'm going to begin with that because in fact, many of these problems actually require social decision-making. And when that is absent, essentially you default to a miasma. The system tries to resolve complex problems on its own without the ability to, to move to social decision-making. So the, what you're dealing with, dealing with in both the private and the public healthcare systems are instances where we've socialized the funding for healthcare. And that creates a requirement, and that's a different issue to, for instance, buying washing powder, buying a cell phone. All of those are in economic terms purchasable within a spot market. In other words, your household budget constraint determines what you purchase. If some new technology enters that market, you make a decision based on your household budget constraint and your own personal preferences. And that market and the signals that you're sending back to the suppliers all come from those decisions. But the decisions are, uh, are disaggregated, they're decentralized. Now, um, the moment you introduce insurance and you introduce public funding of things, you've moved the budget constraint away from the individual household. And and the decisions about purchasing are at the pooled level. They're at the level of the system. In some cases, we're at the level of a, of a large fund. Now, the problem with that is how do you now make rational decisions about the new products that come into the system? How do you make rational, reasonable, fair decisions about that? Um, now, the solution to that is that you have to have a decision invested in decision-making mechanism. And that decision-making mechanism has to have criteria, which include things that involve fairness, um, appropriate consideration of the economics of the supply chain that gets you the product there in the first place. Um, all sorts of uh, criteria that are quite complex to assess in relation to each other. Now, some people have kind of tried to frame this as, well, that's what health technology assessment focuses on. Well, health technology assessment doesn't on its own. Health technology assessment in all spheres in which it's applied only provides a, uh, a, a threshold type analysis after which additional criteria are applied to a final decision. You do not use the health technology assessment as the final trigger for a decision. And that's already starting to tell you how you start to make social decisions. Now, right from the time when Oregon tried to introduce a set of cost effectiveness criteria for the determination of a package of services for the uh, for Medicare and Medicaid, um, which was rejected by the public, 
because the public said, no, that's not our value system that you're applying in your cost effectiveness criteria. So value systems are complex. And I'm going to say why that's important. We go look at the COVID experience and you look at what is typically applied in health technology assessments, which might be a, um, a cost per life saved, cost per life uh, is saved over a lifetime. So looking at the life years that are actually saved and then weighting them again for quality of life. Now, if you use that criteria, you don't prioritize old people, quite simply. So um, COVID, what did we prioritize? Who did we prioritize? <laughs> we prioritized older people and we pr prioritized sicker people. The two groups of people that medical schemes would love to exclude if they wanted to, and the groups of people that the state is failing to provide effective care for at this point in time, because they actually have no prioritization system in place in both systems. But the values of society kicked in in that, and it didn't apply standard cost effectiveness criteria. And that should be telling us something that social decision making is quite important. But that was made as a hip shoot. It wasn't something that was made strategically. It was a gut feel. Science did not inform what people did in COVID. Um, but, uh, and, and I'm going to give another uh, example of why crude assumptions around cost effectiveness analysis are problematic. Um, if we say that we work off and expect a life expectancy as our target life, let's say 78, as our assumed average life expectancy in a particular country, and that's going to be how we will calculate our life years saved. What that implies is that a 79-year-old, a 16-year-old walks up and shoots a 79-year-old. Um, the question is, should we put that person in jail? Well, according to our cost effectiveness criteria, society lost nothing with the 79-year-old who was shot. And the 16-year-old has a whole life ahead of them. So in fact, there should be no penalty. This is the crudity of decision-making that goes into when we apply these principles conventionally. And that means it requires a, cons a considerable amount of thought going into the way in which these crit criteria are formed. Now, I'm gonna give you another example of, uh, the, uh, uh, talk to you about prescribed minimum benefits and that framework and its logic and how it fits into this discussion. Prescribed minimum benefits was meant or intended within the Medical Schemes Act to remove the discretion of medical schemes to determine what conditions they treat. Remove discretion. When somebody tells me that Discovery is doing HTAs and MediHelp is doing some odd version of an HTA or any scheme and some actuary with no training is, is producing some crude analysis that determines that scheme's decision-making of what they include in a PMB, it doesn't tell me that that medical scheme hasn't got a discretion. <laughs> They're applying a discretion. That's not what the Medical Schemes Act was designed to do. The Medical Schemes Act said that discretion is expressly taken away from you. Why is it taken away? Because it then encourages you to negotiate better ways of uh, doing what you're compelled to do, cover that condition properly. Um, and in the case of the interpretation of what is a PMB, it's quite clear that in many cases, nobody is basically looking at the regulations properly. All that is required at this point in time, and I'm perfectly happy on pro bono basis, which is where it'll help anybody dealing with these cases, is how to interpret that in any case where a medical scheme is failing to apply the law and is applied to discretion to determine what is a PMB and what is not a PMB. Once they are forced and compelled to cover something, that funder changes their behavior. When they're not forced to cover it, guess what? They do nothing. And the patient is the last person they care about. But once they, once pe people are compelled to do this, different decision makings kick in. Now, at a, at a, 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 and the, so the purpose of the PMB framework uh, it, it required that in the absence of any kind of formal government level determination of what should be introduced as new technology, which is absent and has been absent for 20 years, despite the fact that it has been, uh, uh, <laughs> every decent health system in the world introduces these structures. South Africa, for, in, for, for some reason, has been focused elsewhere. So in the, what is required uh, is that at this point in time is that you prove what the profound standard of care is.
do. The prevailing standard of care is not public sector treatment. Let me be absolutely clear. Anybody who falls for that trick is failing their patients. The prevailing standard of care is a clinical technical determination, which includes values. And it's important to note that in the case of rare diseases, many countries with proper decision, social decision-making structures differentiate between rare diseases, orphan diseases, and general care. And that's because when you're dealing with high volumes of treatment, even a relatively low cost is very expensive to a system if, it, if it's very prevalent. But in the case of rare diseases, a very, very expensive disease does not cost the system that much. And so that's why NICE and various other countries have differential thresholds for what they would, uh, out of the HTAs, for determining what would go into a package. And it's important to note that that threshold, if you're within that threshold, it means you're automatically in. If you're outside of that threshold, it doesn't mean you're automatically out. You then go into another determination process, which then examines in a multidisciplinary way what the decision should be from a social perspective. Now, what we have to do in South Africa is work out what to do, where we have an absent government that has not invested in a social determination process that can make fair decisions about how we absorb new technology into our public and private systems. We also have a private system that hasn't said, we will take this out of competition. And the reason that nobody's done it is because somebody can actually profit at the medical schemes level by not covering a PMB and a serious condition because they can get away with it because we've got an absent regulator as well. So it's a very, very difficult process for people to challenge the decision of a medical scheme that is arbitrary and where they are theoretically compelled to cover something, but they have decided through a discretion and a commercial decision at their level to decide not to cover something. And it puts, makes them better off than another scheme that is covering that thing. Now that from the PMB framework and the logic of the PMB framework is consistent with the logic of every single well-functioning health system in the world. Certain things, when you have to cover it, you can over time look at how you economize on that coverage. And when I was doing the modeling analysis in about 2002 on the introduction of an ARV program in South Africa that the National Department of Health and its wisdom was refusing to implement, um, did a costing analysis and a modeling analysis over a period of time to show that in fact, when these prices came down to the prices that we face today, it would be affordable. Um, and that, that type of analysis should be done routinely at a social level for determining whether or not you do that treatment. It took a lot of pressure to get this government to cover the ARVs. Um, uh, and, and we failed the country in the time that we took to get that done. So all of these issues, all of the medicines that we're dealing with, the complexity of the health system requires that there is a systematic approach, process and approach to the absorption of new technology. So value-based healthcare and ARMs and stuff don't cure this problem because it doesn't deal with the issue of whether or not we should cover something. But when we've decided we're going to cover something, then in fact, there's going to be a process of if, if it's very, very highly priced of making it affordable over time. Looking at re the SEP framework is obvious. It's, it's a failed structure as it exists now. Eliminating it or changing it is not going to change the dynamic I've just mentioned. What one has to do is to have a, 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 an investment in overall processes of investigating what should be absorbed and how and when, and making sure that those processes of decision-making are free from conflicts of interest. That includes political parties, that includes the private sector, and it, but it requires multidisciplinary processes that are properly invested in because what we're talking about is the purchasing of products for 60 million people. It's, it's a big set of decisions. It's a worthwhile investment. It will bring down costs and it doesn't bring down costs we have. And I'll just point out one thing in terms of how the SEP framework is operating. One of the uh, supervised one student on basically doing volume price arrays in the generic market in South Africa to just show how irrational our current system of pricing is. And what you show is very, very high priced products at high volumes. 
and exactly the same generic molecule being sold at um, at uh, uh, very low volumes at much lower prices. So that is a completely irrational outcome from first year economics 101, because in a rational framework, and you've got two different products that are, that are identical at different prices, a rational person will always pick the lowest one. Well, our industry doesn't. And what that suggests is that there are kickbacks within the system that are operating and one can eliminate all of those. But the first point of departure is what product gets in at a social level and what it does, what doesn't. And I think that that system has to be fixed up. The PMB framework needs to evolve as well. It hasn't because government is trying to destroy the medical scheme system and therefore it has no interest in the social consequences of failing to invest in a major system operating. It has also not done it for the public sector and the public sector also has no rational determination process around what comes in and what, what doesn't. It's pretty much arbitrary. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but it, there is a big problem at the moment, but there are ways of introducing social decision-making even when it's not government. My problem at the moment is that I can't see the industry actually getting together and doing that, even if it is in the interests of society as a whole and even has a commercial rationale, because in that decision making, it can take into account the fact that there are uh, value chains, there is a requirement to make sure that drugs do enter, innovative drugs do enter the market, they can be properly priced, properly reimbursed. But the issue is a system that can make fair decisions over time. And we don't have that. And if one had that at the level of the industry, it would actually allow for the regular regularization of the absorption of new technology in coherent ways. If we had a government, we would have that as a, as a public structure that is established and we should have it. And it's worthwhile as an investment. So at this point in time, we have to look at the, the default arrangements for um, the uh, uh, fragmenting the current decision making structure for the absorption of new technology in the system, and we need to apply coherent and fair principles in doing it, and that would be where the investment needs to come in. <clears throat> I'll leave it there. No comment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, very thought provoking um, and uh, very interesting perspective on where we need to make our decisions and where we need to start making our decisions. Um, so, Alex, if you can provide your solutions in the next session, that would be great. Um, we, we are running out of time, so we're going to ask if we can. Uh, so Lauren Kelly, the we good. Okay. All right. Can I just get your agenda? Okay. Our next speaker is uh Ernst Marie from Icon. Thank you, Ernst. Thanks again. That's Nice to follow that book. <laughs> um, so I work for Icon Oncology. I'm not an oncologist. Um, we are an organization that represents uh, 155 oncologists in private practice in South Africa with a radiotherapy infrastructure and about um, 70 chemotherapy facilities um, across the country. Um, we look at um, treatment protocols, um, exception management, and trying to address the problem that, that's on there. So how do we deliver affordable care that respects patients and family preferences, the duty of medicine to heal, but at the same time control escalating costs? So my talk is very much uh, a practical approach and uh, giving a, a bit of an overview of what Icon has been doing um, over the last few years in, in the medical scheme industry, um, we mainly focus or purely focus in the, in the private sector. Um, I'm not going to delve into philosophical issues. It's really the nuts and bolts. So this is a very generic high level overview of a patient journey um, in, the, in the oncology space. Um, we're looking at um, mostly um, oncology or cancers are diagnosed 
um, by surgeons um, and there's interaction with pathologists and radiologists, hospitals, and then the, the patient gets referred to an oncologist that will decide on systemic treatment or, or radiotherapy, um, and that will then um, leave a, a response. ICON really focuses only on that part of the system, and that can immediately um, highlight the problem um, if we are looking to address access to care in the oncology space. Um, things that we've tried to, to do over the last few years in terms of um, creating more affordable care and making sure that our patient selections are appropriate is um, looking at uh, the cost of systemic treatment um, to look at protocol adherence. Protocols is multidisciplinary or not multidisciplinary, multi-oncologist, um, dare I say, HTA, um, based that we do try and introduce health economics in, in, in our assessments and our stratification of, of treatment protocols. Uh, the cost of radiation therapy, end-of-life care, make sure that there's appropriate palliation in our treatment protocols and patients are referred to palliative care early. Um, try to avoid unavoidable um, um, hospitalization um, through care management and um, look, look at introducing ancillary services um, into uh, the oncology um, pathway as well. Um, we are on our way to, to try and uh, get to a full value-based care agreement. Um, the fee-for-service is often used as a swear word. I think it's very difficult to move away completely from a fee-for-service, even if we talk about value-based care. The, the way that we pay for cancer is really not what determines how the cancer is delivered. We can have value-based treatments with alternative payment models, um, but it can include anything from fee-for-service to capitation models and to um, full value-based payments for, for episodes of care. Um, we started um, a few years ago by introducing um, a risk share agreement with um, Discovery Health, where we try to look at the, the total direct cost of oncology care. And if we refer to direct costs in, in our world, it is the cost that is incurred by the oncologist. So it's the professional fees, the medicines that they prescribe, radiotherapy, and um, what, what happens in, in, their, in their practice, that what the ICON protocols have uh, an impact on. Um, it has been successfully uh, running for, for the last five years, but it definitely um, has its limitations. What was good about it, it taught us to, to really be able to, to measure cost. Um, we understand where the cost is coming from, not just in the oncology, oncologist space, but in the, the whole uh, spectrum of care. Um, we were able to actively address some of the cost drivers. Um, sorry, that mustn't be introduced cost drivers. That was introduced uh, quality metrics. We started to, to, to measure um, quality outcomes in lieu of quality metrics in lieu of actual patient outcomes. And we developed um, quite comprehensive risk models with uh, the actuarial teams at, at Discovery. Um, someone recently told me anything that said before, but must be ignored. Um, the the model has a shelf life. Um, the baseline of comparing costs year on year um, needs to be addressed um, regularly. Um, new modal treatment modalities are often excluded because they're seen as a cost driver and no one wants to take costs on, on new things that wasn't available a few years ago. Um, the modeling is very sensitive. It's very complicated. Small changes lead to um, big results. And um, true outcomes for matters to patients was never actually cap captured. And um, as I mentioned before, we did exclude uh, quite a large part of the cancer journey. Um, just not, okay, lost something up. That, that's not me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Oh, fuck you, you need to tell jokes and sing a song. Saw jokes. Okay. Saw jokes. Yeah. Here, this is where you have to do your guide and yoga. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> That's why we put you in the session, job. Not job. Job. We're job. Okay, maybe we should just take a couple of minutes break. Um, hey, okay, and uh, maybe just get my notes and yeah. no, yes. that's, that's... Oh, that's a better idea. That's not very innovative. <laughs> Okay, so I think the 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 the, the point what I, that I was getting to is that uh, the the model that we we've, we've introduced and which we're still running does serve a bit of a purpose, but it's definitely definitely not a, a, a end all and be all solution, and and it needs to um, develop and uh, into something more comprehensive. Um, and we're back. So it does seem to get stuck there. Oh, there we go. All right, this is what I wanted to show. Um, if we look at this this whole patient journey, um, and um, some of the um, people earlier mentioned um, what happens to people that stay in ICU, the cost drivers of hospitalization. If we start looking at the whole oncology journey, we can see that the cost of actually, when we start talking about price and the price of medicine and what we need to do with reducing the price of medicine, we are ignoring the cost of the, the whole system. To treat a patient in a comprehensive cancer care pathway, most of the, the actual um, cost is lying in um, the initial part of the diagnosis and surgery and the hospitalization of, of that patient. The cost of, of radiotherapy and chemotherapy um, contributes about 21% of, of the total cost. And then the um, um, oncologist attributable hospital admissions cost as much as, as 20%. And a lot go, uh, of that cost is to do with um, end-of-life care, people that are admitted to ICUs and dying in hospital not receiving um, appropriate palliative care. So the the point of all of this is if we want to start introducing alternative reimbursement models and new ways of, of paying for, for, for medicines, um, there's a lot of that we can be doing in improving the whole system of care and looking at um, what the impact of treatment is and what the outcomes of that, that treatment is and how we can reduce cost in, in the long run. So it's really to, to start looking at value-based payments for a, a whole episode of care and this has been spoken about and written about for, for a long time. Um, and it's very, very hard to, to actually put this together. When needs the cooperation of a multidisciplinary team, you need to hear the cooperation of hospital groups. And um, as we mentioned by Gavin, uh, everyone has a, a similar goal. There's an economic incentives and with all the, the best of intents of wanting to get to a common goal, people's own interest often um, uh, is detrimental to, to, to this process. But we have started this and there are um, two breast MDTs and two head and neck MDTs where we have put together pathways. Um, we've not uh, convinced anyone yet to do uh, a value-based payment for, for the whole episode of care. We've also not convinced the, the providers to accept a, a value-based payment for, for the whole ep episode of care. But we are starting to, to capture information and share information in, in those multidisciplinary teams, which allows doctors to um, know what is happening downstream with their patients. And really um, the thread of care um, is, remains intact. Um, so what we're trying to do and achieve the goals, which is in the, in the next slide, 
is really to to look at cost rather than price um, to ensure that um, we have the appropriate patient selection um, right up in the beginning, just after diagnosis, and that patients um, receive appropriate care. You know, too many patients are receiving um, surgery before uh, they've been seen by an oncologist. Um, the enhanced personalized medicine, um, geneticists are very much a critical part of uh, a multidisciplinary assessment. Um, this will allow us to, to measure outcomes that specifically agreed to by the whole um, MDT across the whole um, episode of care. Um, link payments to outcomes. Um, that is what the essence of value-based care is. And that increases the willingness to pay from, from funders as well, if they know that the, what they are paying for is actually going to make a difference to, to patients. Um, there's some of the risk that gets transferred to to providers. Um, they are happy to accept some of this this risk. We'll see when we actually get to that uh, the payment how much of that risk they will accept. Um, and this also allows the incorporation of other alternative reimbursement models, um, which um, many people have touched on, uh, into into a model like um, like this. Um, oh, that's it. Thank you, Ernst. Um, ICON's leading in value-based care, among some other doctor groups, uh, well done. Um, and I think it's one of the solutions we need to look at going forward. Uh, next, we have Dr. Katlejo from the PHF to give us some solutions. Thank you, Fakir. I'm going to be short because a lot has been said. Thanks, okay. That is not impressive, impressive if you think that um, it represents just under 6% growth from the previous year, while beneficiaries who accessed uh, cancer benefits increased by 18%. It gets even here if you look at what you call out-of-pocket payment, and I'm saying what we call because it's not really a true reflection of what people spend personally. Uh, for the same year, it's reported that out of packet payments were uh, numbered, I think, about 36.7 billion rand, and about 35% was for medicines. So we are not doing well in terms of providing the adequate cover for medicines and especially for high cost drugs. And I think uh, we all know that uh, uh, one of the schemes. Um, lost the court case, I think two court cases uh, in the previous year for not being able to afford treatment. I think Alex articulated the issues around interpretation of, of PMBs, et cetera. And they they get really tricky around uh, cancer cancer treatment. Um, so the system is broken and we need to fix it. And unfortunately, the reform processes are not going well either. Uh, whether you're looking at it from a uh, total overhaul of the system or just focusing on PMBs, it's not something that we we, we are doing great uh, in. So we do have to consider what we can do. Um, and it, it can be left to individual organization. It has to be at a systems level um, with the um, uh, intersectoral collaboration. We have to look at alternative ways of funding. Uh, I think maybe two main categories, alternative or innovative ways of funding medicines 
and secondly, innovative benefit designs. Medical schemes have got very archaic um, uh, structural processes in terms of how we define benefits. There are broad categories around acute and, and chronic, and they don't just work. And we have in the past few years started encouraging schemes to look at implementing essential medicine list to try and move away from a diagnosis-based uh, allocation uh, of benefits. That's one area. The second one, um, we started a project uh, early uh, this year or late last year uh, to look at how we can uh, put together a funding mechanisms for high-cost drugs and rare diseases through a cell, cell captive arrangement. Um, that would be uh, through uh, some sort of a reinsurance uh, process. Uh, we have uh, uh, gathered, gathered some support from schemes for us to go ahead with that. And we are at the moment talking to uh, academic centers to assist us with protocols that will guide participation in those uh, uh, in that uh, scheme. We, we had a, a meeting with the registrar um, and as you'd imagine, Alex, uh, <laughs> the meeting went well. <laughs> uh, because uh, reinsurance is a, a swear word in, in our industry. Uh, there has to be an exemption application by schemes if we have to structure anything along those lines. Um, but at least at an um, uh, officer level in the schemes, there, there was some buy-in. But it's something that we, we will definitely push. And we're hoping that uh, by the middle of next day, we will make an announcement on how to assist one another. But it will take, uh, as I said, collaboration uh, among the funders, uh, the pharma companies, as well as the uh, associations. I'm going to stop here, Lauren. I think we, we are a tad late. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katleko. Uh, I hope that cell captive uh, reimbursement model that he's speaking about comes to uh, something substantial and something that can work in the industry. Uh, I think we've come to the end of the session. So thank you for all the, uh, the great talks and the provocative discussion. Uh, we look forward to going into the into a working lunch where we will uh, look at potential interventions uh, to increase patient access. And please bring all those solutions to the table. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So how how this is gonna work is on, on your, we, first of all, the working lunch, the, the lunch will be available outside. You're welcome to go and get it, come in and do your talk. What we're gonna do is we're gonna keep you in the tables that you are, unless there's a really a group of this, this table, like we're looking for excellence out of this table. <laughs> so um, I think we're gonna work in our, in our tables. And what we want to look at is in the table is to assess the viability of some of the interventions that were presented. And how do we leverage the, de um, the different strategies with a common cause and a joint effort. So those are what we're all um, looking at. So ideally what we're trying to do here is look at the potential strategies or interventions that would increase um, um, patient access. Once your, once your table has a list, um, shall, we, shall we put a cap on the list or we're we just gonna put it all out there? I'm gonna ask, I'm asking the team. Numbers, yeah. How many, how many interventions? Five, Kelly says five interventions, top five interventions. Yeah? Top, huh? top three. Alex, could we like, could we get there? There were a lot of, there were, there between Gavin and, and there were a lot of interventions on that list. On the, let's stick to five so that we're as comprehensive as possible. As we heard today, it's a not, one solution is not going to fix all the problems. So top five interventions we could look at to um, increase patient access. Once we've done that, and we'll give you to um, 1.30, Kelly, no, quarter to two, sorry. 
quarter to two, we'll give you, because we're at half past 12 now, hey? Huh? So am I getting the, my times right? So I'm like, yeah, quarter, quarter to two, we're going to come back, choose someone to write down the answers, choose or volunteer someone to um, report back on your five answers. We're then going to go back into the groups again and look at a way forward on what are we going to do and how are some of those things, what we can take forward. So first, first working session during lunch is assessing assessment of the viability of the presented inf interventions and then how we can lever leverage different strategies for a common joint effort. Potentially looking at potential interventions to increase patient access. Any questions? Top five. Okay, quarter to two. We'll tell you. We'll tell you when you got fifteen minutes late, so that you can um, choose your lamb to slaughter um, when they come to present forward. Okay, thank you, everyone. This is not the ideal presentation of a very good set of ideas. However, uh, I need to explain that we were taken through this by. Shall I refer to him as our headmaster, who had to leave and were taking notes frantically. And in doing so, we might have missed some points. So I'm just going to explain at a very high level the kind of system that Alex thinks needs to underpin all the elements that we've been talking about, all the five to 10 elements that you said we need to list and see if they'll be viable. Before all of those are considered, you first need some kind of systemic rearrangement. Uh, we need to have a system that will underpin, underpin all the other things that we want to talk about. And it's got three basic elements. First of all, it needs to have central pooling. And that's something that Katleho from BH have mentioned. Secondly, there must be part of this must be approval for new technologies, and that's where your HTAs would fall. Thirdly, you need to have a space for essential packages, and that's where your PMPs will be. And the one key element of all of this is that there has to be an obligation for people to, people shouldn't have a choice to say, we're not going to do this. I think Alex said that over and over again. So there must be some kind of structure that's going to either enforce this or we have some kind of contractual arrangement as an industry to ensure that no one runs away from their obligations in this system. Now, once we have that in place, then you can have a system that allows the purchasers, the suppliers and the providers to start negotiating. And that's where you'll have your Negotiations around ARMs, value-based systems. The one problem I think that Alex mentioned, you can elaborate on that, Cavello, is then we have to decide what to do with SCPs. But I think once we've reached the stage, it should be easy for us to decide whether we still need SCPs, despite all the, all the positives Gavin mentioned about what SCPs have done for us. I'm going to ask Cabello and Vicky to add anything that I've missed out. Sorry, this is very high level, but just to repeat, <laughs> just to repeat, you need you need a systemic rearrangement. Otherwise, we're wasting our time talking about arms and, and value-based systems. Good question. When you spoke, when you spoke about the systemic reimbursement, rearrangement, yeah. How would, would that have to happen at government level or would Yeah, so this is actually a view on the private sector, right? Um, and this particular, these three call it a uh, special purpose vehicles for lack of a better word, but this is almost the industry coming together and agreeing. So you have an alignment in the industry that everybody is going to play by these principles. What that then does is that a richer scheme will not receive an influx of members because they're reimbursing on a particular molecule for a disease and the other one isn't. Everybody is going to be obliged to reimburse 
on product X or Y. So that equalizes the playing field, so to speak. And then the purchase, the, the suppliers and the providers can then participate here. And it, there has to be some mechanism for them to negotiate, right? So you're not then worried about a, um, a scheme not reimbursing on a product because here you've got a broad package of PMBs, which you've all agreed to. You've agreed that you're going to participate on the set of principles. You've agreed that you're going to participate in the central pooling. This particular um, nodule, if I can call it that, this is the gateway for any new technologies. So this will evaluate new technologies that come upstream and you could use HCAs or whatever other mechanisms that you want to use to work out the, um, the cost effectiveness, et cetera, of the molecules. But once it's in the system, everybody agrees they're going to play by that set of rules. So, yeah. so that central uh, block is like nice? Yeah. And then what he said was like for the pooling, it's a financial pooling. So it was like a risk equalization fund that you said you want to do. Mm -hmm. And then what did SR stand for? Social or something? That was the reinsurance at Katla uh, Yeah, the social, social reinsurance. reinsurance. Yeah. And, and so are those supposed to be, are you saying all the top tier, are those all the existing medical schemes? So, so it would be existing medical schemes? playing in this three so we need to so, so so you you do need alignment in industry or else you're going to bankrupt one scheme sorry ultimately if you're all offering the same or you compelled to offer the same benefit at the same cost mm. then you know, some are going to fall by the wayside because of other costs that the internal costs that might not be sustainable. Yeah. But over a period of time, they're going to whittle away and you're going to end up with a very small number of schemes, which is not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. But I'm just I'm just wondering why, you know, it, there's going to be a lot of wasted time in getting all the schemes together to get them to align and agree on those. Mm -hmm. Whereas maybe there's a level above that where you say, well, let's start with less schemes than we have and there's less discourse yeah he gave an and analogy that i thought was very interesting and that was sas switch mm -hmm. he said that's what they do they've all contracted and the fact is that everybody has to have bought in you have to otherwise it's not going to work and i think that's i don't know much about sas switch but i think that's how it works so it's almost like a common thing for the whole industry and and it's a it's it's the same benefit but not at the same cost right so you're obliged to provide the benefit, but through the negotiation and any other value added services that you'd want to provide as a medical aid, that would be your differentiator, not what you're covering. And I think that's what that addresses. So you could cover for a rare disease, but how efficiently you do it could differentiate you from the next scheme. This is okay. loving to prevent and and you have to take care of my sorry, sorry. <laughs> I think the other the other point he made was being a, a reinsurance body. It falls under the financial um, sort of act and not under um, CMS or anything like that. And there's nothing to prevent uh, the schemes from going this way. And mm -hmm. then you become un under a totally different authority. <laughs> Thanks. I, I will be brief. I actually agree that medical schemes should all pay the same the same amount for the same benefit. They should rather have competition on how good the administration is, how easy it is for us to have access or the patient to that. And um, I think that is a much better playing field, especially for patients, of which we all are patients. So I'm, I'm quite sure everyone sitting here is on a medical scheme. And um, I, whether Discovery is paying 80 rand for my for my blood pressure tablet or med, whether it's MediHelp, it should be 80 rand, should be all the same type of tablets. The difference will be if discovery is rude towards me or my family and not coming to the party, I can go over to MediaUp and they're very friendly till they're not friendly anymore. Thanks. Um, yeah, my turn, Gabelo. So, <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to abuse um, the microphone. I'm very curious because 
Um, we do have um, some medical schemes in here. I'm kind of curious their thoughts on the proposal. And I'm looking at one now, but... Uh, and, and maybe before you hand over to the medical scheme, I just want to make a point there. It's it's not more about the medical scheme or paying that 80 rand, right? It's about you, them covering it. What they actually pay to the manufacturer, that, that could be managed at the bottom and can be negotiated. So they could look at a cost of one molecule or they could look at the total cost of care and negotiate and get efficiencies in there. But as a principle, they should all cover that package, uh, cover what's in that essential package there. Yeah. I think from a scheme's perspective, it's possibly a solution, but I think without the risk equalization fund, you still got the issue that you'll attract more than you can possibly afford within your scheme. So, but I think one of the things they did recommend was a second tier that looked at equalization. And funny enough, I mean, our first two points are, are very similar. So we got to look at a way that we manage the risk, we equalize. And, and that takes into consideration the scheme size. So the bigger the scheme, the more you'd contribute towards that. Um, thank you for that. I think that's brilliant, and I love the harmonization idea. Sorry. Thank you. On our last meeting at an ice bowl, we they had a suggestion that we can use one HTA template for all the medical schemes, so that we don't have to double. Uh, for instance, if somebody have to do an HTA on a product B or product A the other companies or the other schemes, they have to do it. They don't have to do it because one is already done. They are using the standard template. They are using the same because what you was pick up is that each and every uh, uh, scheme will use a different template for them to, 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 to come with some uh, outcome of their HTA. So that was the suggestion that was put forward. And some of the people that were representing the medical scheme, they really like that idea. I'm not sure if it's going to work or not. Um, I was saying it's brilliant, and I love it, especially for the public sector, for the private sector. My question is, how do we also apply the same say to state if we are wanting to do to do this? Because I mean, the majority of our population is in state, right? Um, yeah, you, you're quite right. We we actually didn't uh, look at the the public sector, right? Um, and I mean, for me, anecdotally, if we think about what was said earlier, um, that public sector very rarely reaches out to pharmaceuticals to ask for products. And I think the moment that they do reach out, there is an opportunity for negotiations. And it's really between the national department and the particular entity to then decide how we can actually enable access. Is it confidential um, contracting where prices are unpublished? That's that's a possibility. Is it the solution? I don't know. You know, so it's I think there are various options for for public. Um, they just need to be explored. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I said we need access for patients from the desert to the sea. So uh, this is for the private sector. And this systemic rearrangement is a great idea, but I think it's a long-term solution and a solution for a select few. So my view is let's uh, work together to find solutions for the entire population within the current framework. Um, uh, you see, lo we're looking at, at transforming the framework. Yeah, yeah. We're looking at transforming the whole framework, I for you. But uh, there's, there's short-term wins that we can implement now. So we'll present those short-term wins that we believe we can implement now. I think this is important in the longer term. So maybe we should separate out our thing into short, medium, and long. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, if I if I may, if I, uh... If this appears to be based on the private sector, 
This is because this thing itself is based on the fact that most of the points raised were based on the private sector. And it is not intended to be long-term. And the last point I'd like to make is that Alex has undertaken to do a write-up of this and share it with everyone. And then what we'll do is give him some of the points that have been raised. How will it apply to the public sector? Is it long-term? What needs to be done to put to, for it to be in place? And then it will be shared with everyone. Thank you. So uh, <laughs> I think everybody wanna, wants to go after you. Forget. But you, you write in that we have to find solutions for the entire population, right? But we also have to go about it in a stepwise fashion. Um, we, we do, right? So right now we are sitting with a problem in the private sector where we've got uh, funders that are needing to fund high cost meds. You've got pharmaceuticals that need to play and want to broaden access. You've got patient advocacy groups that want access to meds. So it's how do you try and solve for the short term, for the short term, short term and the now, but not lose sight of that long term. So this is not losing sight of the long term. It's addressing a problem now that we're sitting in, and it could provide learnings which could be applicable in that long term as well. Right. Yeah. Mark, Mark, and then oh, let me go. No, sorry, I've got my child's phone in because they never know when not to phone. So I think what 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 we need to realize is that there are two like different streams in our healthcare system, right? The private and the public. And the solutions that we're gonna come up with are not going to be an umbrella that's gonna to apply to both systems. So this is great that we are, I mean, our current problem, obviously what we are tackling is in the private sector, but there definitely are solutions. I mean, we've come up with some for the public sector as well, where we feel like we could win there as well. So I don't think we must then almost put ourselves in a corner where we feel like we must come up with this one great solution that's going to apply because our system, health system doesn't work that way. It's, it's completely, completely different. The only common thing here is the patient. So we definitely have to think of those solutions for the different streams that can work at the same time, solving both private and public. Hey, thank you. Well done. You listened well in class. You all get an A, an A, an A for effort. <laughs> <laughs> who who who's going next? Are we just going to go through the? Okay. Efra, everybody, it's just the three of us. Please, please don't stress us. Please, our principal is gone. Our president is gone. Please. Thank you, everyone. I've been alloc allocated the, the yeah. uh, unfortunately, the position to present our five points, but I will try and do it to the best of my ability, be it that the people that actually thought up most of these ideas have actually left the room. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let me start. So um, we looked at it from the perspective of what can we do with the current situation at hand. Um, and we came up with some solutions and I think they've actually pretty much across the board. I think they're similar to some that I've, we've been hearing all along. So essentially a single HTA, and but this is important in the sense that there has to be buy-in from all the various stakeholders to achieve this. And it needs to be um, something that is a framework that is devised in terms of how the whole industry can adopt it and apply it. Um, so that is what we think. They might need to be a centralized HTML. <laughs> a 
centralized um, process that we can apply. The next point is how can we actually lower the price of the drugs at the end of the day? We can try and do this in a, the most legal way possible, and that is by what Gavin introduced, a second branded product at a coming in at a different lower price. So that is a possibility of looking at that. Um, the next one is to risk sharing, um, using the, the 36, section 36B of the legislation and actually use that 36.2 of the legislation to actually um, get around the constraints that we have around single exit pricing at the moment. So that is one of the other ways. Then again, pooled funding with risk equalization, which is actually from all parties, you know, having income in order to fund these products from a pooled resource and apply a standard or a universal way of assessing requests. So at the end of the day, the applications will be considered by people that have the know-how, the experience, as well as the um, unbiased approach to funding. And they would be reviewed um, you know, in a structured manner so that at least there's specific protocols that have been written. So the patients would who have access to this should be reviewed in a standard and um, structured process way. And then part of Ernest's um, um, proposal was that sh there should be re uh, value based pricing um, for a whole episode of care and not just isolated care, taking into consideration the whole patient's cost of care at the end of the day. And go. Uh, I thought you introduced a concept of unbiased attitude towards fund towards funding. What do you mean by that? Unbiased review. Unbiased review. You know, when you have a organization that might be reviewing requests for products very high cost, there should be no entities involved in that review pay process that will have a vested interest. Especially in the cost. Any other questions? Oh, look at you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, who's next? Angelique. Let me just put this down. So it's a very good question. Lauren's running around with the press stick in her hand. Yeah. Can you small pieces? Small pieces. We are the only female group. Before we start, I just want to say female power. Um, I want to say something. This whole debate makes me think about, you know, I'm sitting in my rooms and here comes the old lady and the old man coming in. You see this old man and you think, God, why it's me today? The lady sits down, the, the wife sits down and he sits, sits next to her and then she starts. She says, my husband, blah, 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 blah. And then me and her, you know, the whole time about the husband. The husband is sitting there. He's not in the picture. We, we talk about him. He's there. But he's not there. And this makes me think about this. So what we thought, first of all, we put ourselves in the role of the patient. So remember, you can have all of this. But if the patient is not coming through the system, there's no one to treat at the end of the day. So. We need to look at the ecosystem awareness at primary health care, community level, especially for your high risk patients. To make this uh, very um, simple, you need to get uh, uh, media out there 
to educate your patients. You need to educate your doctors. You, you need to educate your nurses at the primary healthcare level. You need to start there. You need to pick up the patients that needs intervention, especially your high risk patients. Someone said, you know, we have tried to do this, especially around campaigning for HIV, and we don't really get it. We don't get where we want to. There's a lot of campaign out there. One of the things is um, last week I sat with the, at the South African Primary Healthcare Conference, and I was listening to all these beautiful presentations. And one of the things that came to mind is we have a huge, huge level of very important people. We have the, the HODs and the, you, you don't know, I, I don't know what they're all called. Everyone there will say, yes, we need to get the healthcare workers to do more on the campaigning part. Actually, it's your job. It's not the healthcare workers' job. We pay you. It's time to, to roll up your sleeves and start to work in your positions that you are sitting in and not taking a responsibility away from you and give it to someone who barely have matric. And the other thing, the other people who were blamed was the data capturers. Now, I want to say today to you, it's each and every one of you who works with a patient, it's your responsibility to make sure that we capture what is happening with that responsibility with that patient and do not shift our responsibility. So first, for us, the ecosystem, we need to address the stigma that's around patients. We need to make sure that patients are supported. If I make a diagnosis today of a patient with breast cancer, I need to know whether it's a pu public or a private sector patient. This is the ecosystem awareness. I need to be able to get that patient the help needed without that patient going to the hospital with a referral letter and then get being scolded by someone who says, you had money to pay for a biopsy in private sector. Why can't you go and get your treatment at private sector? I do not need the medical scheme to tell me this patient is not long enough on this. She's not a year on this medical scheme. And now she's got breast cancer. Now I have to prove that she hasn't had it before, or that she didn't know it before. Guys, come on. We just need to, we need to up our game. We need to make sure we want to try and change. We need to start at, uh, at base level. We need to have effective registers to support healthcare decision making and um, resource prioritization um, or around our registers. I don't think we have proper registers. And if we have registers that are not you know, it's, it's like also I have a car, but I don't service it. But I have a car. So we have registers maybe. Do we fill them in the way we should? Is there anyone looking at this? Is there anyone making sure that these registers are being completed every day? Is there, is, are these registers speaking to each other? Is the public sector register speaking to the private sector? Do we have that? If we don't have it, we don't have data, we can forget about it. We also agree with an independent body making decision regarding uh, allocation of health resources at societal level. Independent people, where the previous group also um, alluded to that. Then we have a need a transparent governance system to manage schedule as 36.2 exemptions. We all agree on that one. And then we, the last one, we need to have a public-private collaboration for effective patient navigation. So what we, what we mean here is not the same than there. There is to make sure the patient gets diagnosed and that we can at least send the patient somewhere. Here we are saying we need to make sure that if the patient has now been diagnosed with a mammogram, that the journey from where she now needs to go to the specialist, to the oncologist, that that journey is also looked at because it's not only her journey, it becomes a journey of her family. It becomes a whole journey. And we should stop looking at a disease, at, at the breast. This is the treatment and stop fighting about it. Look at the patient holistically. We don't do that. And if someone said, we try to do the same thing over again and then we fail. Yes, we fail because we don't think out of the box. We need to look at that. 
On the public-private collaboration, it is true. We don't trust the public sector and they don't trust us. And there's various reasons for that. So we should stop that. We should look at, you know, the NHI, um, everyone is talking about NHI and always said it's only the, the funding model. It's not telling me anything. But I know they're talking about CAPS. So if we have CAPS in, in communities where the private GP and the local clinic works together and we, we get that trust, it will benefit the patient. Is that difficult? No, it's not difficult. But what does it need? Freaking political will. We need to get political will. All the politicians, we need to get that. If we don't do that, forget about it. We can talk and talk and talk till the para is to come. Nothing is going to happen. So please, my plea is let us work together and find a common solution on ground level and then all the rest will fall in place. But remember, the patients doesn't come through the system. Nothing is going to happen. Thank you so much. Questions? Questions? I'm scared. No, I just wanted to say I really loved it because it's very patient-centric and I'm all about patience. So well done. Okay. Yes. Does anybody here know about the system? I, I cannot remember. It might have been an Anglo-American set up because they had people working here who they would um, get diagnosed with something like TB or HIV. And those guys would then go home to Mozambique or to Lesotho or whatever. And they started a, a, a system on the computer where there was like a fingerprint for each patient so that when that guy went back to Mozambique, his local clinic was able to punch him in and go, okay, he's on such and such and so and so and his last blood's with us and that sort of thing. I don't understand why we can't have that cross-cutting across private sector and the public sector so that I don't know how many people I've heard of who've had to fall out of private sector and go into the public sector and then they start right at the beginning with the queues and there's no information about them, no bloods, no records. Yep. Thanks very much. Um, oh, right. Yeah, so we, we heard in a meeting the other day that um, according to the health dashboard, the Department of Health's health dashboard, and that quote me, 82%, I think, was the number that was thrown out. 82% of public healthcare users are happy with the healthcare system. That was quoted to us by the department. Yeah. You, you can be assured. We were also, we were in shock. But I think, Mandy, just to your point, I mean, as, as Rare Diseases South Africa, this issue that you speak about is something that happens often because of the fact that our patients are at their multi-systemic. So you're seeing a whole bunch of different clinicians and cardiology doesn't speak to pulmonology, doesn't speak to neuro. So we developed a, a, patient, a, a patient passport, which is essentially like your road to health booklet. That's just a little bit on steroids. Uh, where it's the patient's responsibility to make sure that every doctor's visit, they write an update, and then at least the next doctor knows. Because the managing the comorbidities when everyone's trying to treat different symptoms, et cetera, becomes such a nightmare. And the wasteful expenditure, because you'll find that the same patient, every clinician that they've been to has done the same full blood count. So, yeah, simple intervention. Sorry, Kevin. So... Two, two answers. The system you're talking about was funded by USAID. So if you go and speak to the consulate, they'll be able to put you in contact with the guys who developed that. Um, in South Africa, the Department of Health, and don't throw tomatoes at me, <laughs> um, have created a single patient database. Milani Vomerantz manages that. And when I left in 2019, it was already established. An idea is that, that that then becomes a central point, which then the systems bounce off so that you it's a unique identifier. Um, and that's why I keep on saying, 
if we as a collective can work together, there's some things that are good in government, not all. I don't agree with the uh, 80% <laughs> bigger you said. I would be shocked. Um, a little bit of hair that's left of my hand, head would stand up. But um, but I, yeah, there they are initiatives. And, and I think what needs to happen is someone's got to go through the initiatives and almost document them and say, okay, well, this is working. Here are some lessons learned. And so they also that there's there is that cross pollination between what the partners, the PEPFA partners do, and the National Department of Health. And so the lessons learned from that sort of project then gets moved into what what they do. Um, personally, whether NHI happens or not, I think having that central patient register hmm. is a critical issue. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, Fakir. So it's proposed in the, in the NHI bill, actually, the electronic health record. Yeah, so it's something that we should work towards. It's coming. First marginal should be released in March. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Yeah. 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 I just want to, to comment on, on, I just want to comment on that. I think it's extremely important for the public sector, whoever the, for Melania and her team, um, to actually speak with us practitioners that is in the private sector that are making use of electronic health record systems for many years on really how do we as doctors dot, capture the data and look at the data? How do we utilize? What do we want? Because the stuff that I have seen before, and I'm not talking about this from Milani's, is normally not really friendly for us. So you're not going to use it. Administrative tasks that have happened elsewhere. 30%, and we say we've got a shortage of doctors, Sama. Um, we have a shortage of doctors. All we do is remove the duplication of the system and we almost increase the doctor's capacity in this country significantly. By 30%, wow. Sure, okay, any other? No? All right. Who's uh, who's the lucky foe person this time? <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, I'll stand in the front. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll be, I'll be short because I think most of what's on here has already been said. I'll just mention the key things out of it that maybe hasn't been mentioned. So the first around common HTA and compliance submission. The one element, one of our team members made a suggestion, for instance, that at the point of registration, when a pharma company submits to SAPRA, maybe even at as early as that, if you have a structure that's doing common HTA is when you should be submitting it. And even beyond that, is actually that company potentially should be the one submitting all that data anyway. But then what you need is the skill set sitting within that common HTA regulatory structure to understand that data. So it's not a, a lack of will on farmers' part to submit, you know, health economic data. It's also about who's ingesting it and what they're able to do with it. The other element about common HTA is that it doesn't actually have to be just private because as we mentioned, public uses it as well. And if we think about our regulatory, existing regulatory bodies, we don't actually need another parallel space. In a private sector, we have a regulator called the CMS. Why couldn't this be sitting there as an example? Um, the second one was related to uh, risk equalization funds, which has already been spoken about. Um, one of the good examples mentioned was saying, in a medical scheme world, having a rare disease patient for a closed scheme can debilitate that scheme. But for an open scheme can be a cost they can absorb. So this makes sense, yes, in a rare, rare disease and cancer space um, so that you get more volumes. But actually, if you really even wanna get more volumes, why don't we consider even public? 
because then we really get more volumes to get better buying power. Um, yes, the complexity is involved. I can see some of the faces going, how could that work? But just consider if we're talking about buying power and price, et cetera. Uh, the next part and the reason we've put in steps as well is because we don't see one thing working alone. So common H2A and submission is not going to solve our problems. The point is just to get a common understanding. So a farmer isn't submitting 15 things to 15 different people, but rather that farmer saying, okay, here's what I got. Um, the industry agrees on the evidence part. And then as industry, we can look, look at how we fund. So offer of a discount or some of the other things that I've spoken about around negotiation. The important element also then becomes how you measure outcomes. So it's all well and good to put systems in place, but you have to measure impact. So if you agreed to say, we'll give you a 50% discount to this fund for this rare disease, year two, let's actually evaluate. Did it really achieve what we said it would? And if it doesn't, actually it looks like we need another 50% discount or whatever the case might be. But if you don't measure something and, and really evaluate it, you're not really gonna know what the outcomes are of it. The last point for me is a little bit of a, I've been in a few of these conversations and lots of people here have said they've been in these conversations for years. So for me, it's a thing of until we get a unified effort and really say, why, why, why haven't we done this? Nothing's new here, we've spoken about it. What's it gonna take and what are the vested interests we have to put aside, each of us, to start somewhere? What is that one thing we can all agree to start on? Just throwing it out there. Thank you. Yeah, questions? There, over the years, there have been multiple efforts, but they're fragmented. And um, so I think the first thing is, is that there needs to be a focus. And remember, we're just talking cancer. Now you can imagine now you've got all the other disease groupings. But this requires investment. Um, and this is, if if you try and play um, amateur crickets against the Springboks, you're going to lose. Okay. And so if we try and be, do this in terms with volunteers and me going to my day job and then going back and contributing, then I get tied up with budgets and negotiations and stuff. There's fragmentation as well in terms of the effort. You need quality people with the right skill sets driving it. You, you, you don't have to have the brains trust sitting doing that, but the brains trust guide the worker bees who do it mm -hmm. but you need worker bees who carry you from meeting to meeting because we all sing kumbaya we all get a fuzzy feeling and we all leave home very happy we had a good meeting good meetings are not outcomes mm. i see i see lauren's hands up you know, climb Raise on. yourselves <laughs> i'll climb on my horse so and um, i agree with you gavin and the, the the thing that I've often asked, right, is what can you learn from HIV? Always, like, what can you learn from HIV and TB? You know what I can learn is I need a global fund <laughs> that's backing me so that my so that my annual income is 36 million or 60 million rand, and then I've got 45 people working for me with with economic economists and program managers and um, m and &E experts and that, because that's what those organizations have. That's what those organizations have. And that is because there is investment into them. And the red-headed stepchild of NCDs and, and rare diseases have one-tenth, not even, one percent. Okay, am I be that's a better number, huh? better number. And I can tell you this because Kelly and I laughed about it the other day. We laughed, but we laughed with tears in our eyes. We were at a meeting, and we had of of the patient users and who who so all the small the groups that we work with. Right, we were in a room at the hotel, and then there was an HIV AIDS group next door. Never heard of them. Never heard of them. Do not exist. Not one of the big ones. And we know a lot of them. Right. You look at the level and the thing. They had interpreters. 
that everyone had gifts, everyone had a t-shirt, everyone was like this, there was, they got tea, afternoon and morning tea and lunch, okay, and we sat there, there wasn't one printout on the table and that, we had an online thing, Kelly and I were dancing in front trying to keep everyone at you. On time, we had a little, we had some tea and biscuits at the beginning, and there was Mark, huh? Yeah, I kicked them out for lunch, said, Bring your own, pack your own lunch. And there was a marked difference in the investment in that. And so, you want to know what the difference is with HIV and AIDS? They got money, they moneyed. That's the difference. I can learn all the lessons I want to from HIV and TB, I don't have the money to implement one of those lessons. <laughs> I would also just like to say um, that when you signed the register on the way in, you missed the fine print because we're all married now, folks. <laughs> Inadvertently, you've put your hand forward to be the group that pushes this forward. Okay, so who drew the straw here? <laughs> Hannes didn't even know. <laughs> I'm scratching my name off that register. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't. And and again, I think most of the things have been said already. And I was just actually just thinking about what everybody says. And, and I think HDA comes up in all the conversations. And I'm thinking, you can't really think about HDA and a strong HDA. And I know we're talking about South Africa, um, but I don't, very importantly, the Africa Medicines Agency in terms of regulatory harmonization when it comes to oncology and rare diseases, you can't really spend all that effort and time submitting dossiers at all the different countries, right? And, and SARPRO is running the tool because of our digital capabilities or the pilot um, for AMA. Um, and I think, speaking under correction, but we probably expect uh, Department of Health to ratify um, AMA next year, early-ish, somewhere, uh, as far as I understand. So, one step forward also, because we have to have product available for us to discuss alternative reinvestment models. Um, so we just listed three, but it, but it's really group listings because we listed discount-based alternative reimbursement models uh, up front. And, and those could be subdivided into ones where SCP is a problem and those where it's not. Um, because if we talk about uh, reimbursement it doesn't have to be if you talk about pricing it is um, so so that's the first component there um, and it really hinges then for for the SAP pieces about uh, around an approved non-visible net price um, that that is obviously governed um, at, at the right levels um, and and key to that is that solid government framework um, to, to make sure governance happen, to make sure that everything is evaluated uh, with, with the necessary due diligence. Um, and then value-based uh, decisions, we spoke about pricing and reimbursement. I think what is key is transparency. I think um, what is value, transparency around what is value is more important than transparency around price potentially. And that value could be different between therapeutic areas. It could be different between countries, depending on what uh, treatments are available with, within specific countries. Because uh, it does cover clinical, um, the, the economics, as well as the, 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 the patients. And then um, finally, innovation fund. Uh, I think Anban way back then said uh, about or spoke about the innovation fund and nobody's using it or they're not motivating properly enough. And I think that's probably one of the components if we talk about unsolicited solicited bids, is that not a vehicle through which unsolicited bids or applications for, for tender inclusions could, could happen through? Um, and all of that could happen through uh, maybe a centralized organization, maybe it's through Section 36 uh, to, in, in terms of governance and, and managing that. That's it. Anything else? Yes. Thanks, Hannes. Questions? Questions? 
Oh, uh, there we go. <laughs> I don't want to speak on behalf of government, but there's no one here. She was she, online, but she had, she to, had go. to leave. Um, the unsolicited business. And um, Jackie from Wits a few years ago did a very nice presentation. There's been two nice papers, and I think it's important. I don't mean NICE nuts. Um, I think it's important for everyone to read that and understand how decision making happens in government. Um, because I would categorically state here that it is possible to get your technology into the system and up. Okay. But you've got to do the, the work. Okay. And you can't take government the same document you prepared for discovery because discovery looks at certain things from a different vantage point. And that's why I was talking about the public health mindset. So if you're writing from a specialist medicine perspective and, and just assuming certain things, it's not going to, it's going to fall on deaf ears. If I had to start standing up here and speak Portuguese, which I cannot do, none of you would, okay, I don't know, assumptions again, <laughs> few people would understand me. It is, we choose not to speak the language of government, and so government cannot hear us. And I would then argue we have no intention of being heard. There are systems. So basically what you do is you put together your health technology um, package, you sit down with a professor at one of these beloved universities around the country, they take it to their PTC, their PTC says, wow, this is amazing technology, and it goes to the provincial PTC and from the provincial PTC to the national body can bear me out, and that's a system, okay? But people are lazy and they want to go straight to, gov to, to, to national, and they, they don't want to work within the rules which government has made for themselves. We can lament, is it clever, is it stupid, and those, but there are rules and it can be done. But everyone says it's impossible. It is possible. I've been on the other side and um, seen these things come through. The other important bit for, for all of us, I mean, we, we can talk until we blew the, the colleague who was speaking about information. Ernst spoke about you know, oncology and the, the full cost of care. Um, I've forgotten your name, sorry. Hannes gave a nice example of the expand, how being penny wise and pound foolish, looking at expanded. But that requires building up information about what it costs for a full patient journey. We either look at the medicine, and there's a big medicine focus here. We all look at the medicine, or we all look at professional fees, or we look at hospital. But it's very rare that someone has done what Ernst is trying to do and look at the full value chain. So we all sit here and bemoan and put sackcloth on and cry. There are systems to do it. It's just we choose not to do it. And do not take government, private sector figures. That is like me standing up and starting to be swear and, 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 and use profanities and then expect you to be nice to me. Okay, Really, from a health economic perspective, the two systems are distinct and they are different. Sure. Any comments? <laughs> so, so it's interesting, and and I don't I don't dispute that, and I don't dispute the fact that there is a system, and that perhaps it is workable. I think sometimes when we sit and we look at experience and things that have happened, and I mean we can look, for example, at um, I don't want to pick, but let's say just use a map something that I guess there was an indication, there was a demand from a hospital level reached the PTC, and there was also a lot of activism and advocacy and noise. Um, there was eventually negotiation, a tender, um, there was price accepted. Um, it's, I believe now on the EML, but utilization is extremely poor. And so, the question then, I mean, and 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 I don't want anyone to shoot me, but why put all that if you know the effort it takes from a time perspective to a resource perspective to get de generate demand not from one hospital 
but a number of hospitals in different provinces to get to that point where there's enough pool or interest, then go through some kind of a review at a national level. The review that may happen may also then look at price. They utilize obviously publicly available data. They view the review and the, and the publicly available data in this case could be SCP. And they could simply at that basis say, then no, it's not affordable. It's not cost effective, done. There's no impetus then for procurement to go forward. When it does, and you do then have enough push for some kind of negotiation, and it does eventually get on tender, then you have to do what? You go to the doctors at a hospital level. Why are you not using? You know, I've got this budget, and I have to make a decision. Yes, your product is much more affordable now, but I have to decide whether I'm going to give so many patients, 100 patients this, versus 20 or 20 patients yours. And so that's my maths. And then all that work, what does it actually amount to? So, I mean, I, I get it, but and I'm, I'd be happy to hear your perspective. Thank you. So I'm, I'm just going to give some arguments. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I have to declare, I chaired the meeting where trastuzumab was added on as an essential medicine, and I did negotiate with Roche at the time, and they would not give me 500 rand. That was, the committee had given me a price. They had to decrease their price by 500 rand, or else it would have been an essential medicine two years earlier. Okay, There's a lot of emotional energy around trastuzumab and the Western Cape for some peculiar reason. And, you know, I, the blue people will, will most probably put me on a most wanted list. Again, you know, I've been under the radar. Now they're going to say, you see that steel? You've got to, we should have buried him. Okay. Um, for some irrational, illogical reason have this block against trastuzumab, and that permeates through the system. But let's look at rituximab, okay? It is widely adopted, it is widely used, um, and it was a no-brainer, and to give you the history, Roche was sitting with me with trastuzumab, and I said to them, I'm actually interested in rituximab, can you give me a price? That's how it became an essential medicine, to be very frank and open with you. I'm still working with, uh, with um, but at the time. It's <laughs> not my fault you've got old timers. <laughs> um, so, but to go back, government is not stupid, okay? So you also can't use SEP to compare with the private sector because there's logistics that, you know, remember the SEP is inclusive. So there are models, okay? And also you expect volume discounts. So if you've got a genericized um, product, they have a percentage, okay? I'm not gonna do that because they'll also hang. So they, they take the SCP and they say, well, we've modeled and they, they've, they've got a database where they look at the SCPs and the tender prices and they know what the ratio is. And then they apply that in their thinking, okay? For a new tech, technology, there's a full health economic assessment and they arrive at a willingness to pay. So they will say to Khadija, who at the moment does attenders, go and buy me a bottle of water and I see value at 3,000 rand, okay? And then the suppliers come up. So th there's this mythology that um, they use SEP. They don't. It would be, then they should then they should actually be put in a town square and shot, okay? Because it, stupidity is a sin, okay? So, so literally that does not happen. There is quite a fair amount of sophistication, but and look at something like bedaquiline in, in TB. Look at how rapid from the clinical trials to adoption, okay? So there are systems to deal with it, okay? Um, it's, it's just partly because we have given up, okay? We have given up fighting in the system, okay? And, you know, I still remember going just up the road over here around Pompeii and yeah, I won't mention too much of those diseases um, and negotiation. And again, we were so, so close to, um, and then one of the manufacturers that will not be mentioned pulled out of the, the situation. So there've been a lot of sparks of, you know, hope that just, for, for lack of um, structure, and so the HIV folk have that structure to pull it across as opposed to, and that's why I said, we can't do this on a piecemeal basis. You do really need professional lobbyists and those sort of folk 
um, who really pulled this thing through. And it's not only Global Fund, by the way, it's PEPFAR. <laughs> uh, there, there is deep, deep pockets um, behind, behind that. So, um, yes, it's a lot of work. But at the end of the day, the volume that you are actually negotiating is massive. And, you know, I look at how much energy I put in at the moment to get discovery, which is tiny, minuscule compared to government, to buy my drugs. Then surely for that volume on a proportional basis, surely I should be prepared to put on that ratio more energy to get it into government. Okay. Um, but I do accept that the Trastuzumab, because of the history, is a bad example. Okay, and it's irrational that it is not being used the way it should be. But I also point out rituximab, which I believe is used better. Leo, I just want to say you should do it so that Belinda doesn't stand up having lost two sisters. And if that's the motivation that gets you going, then that's we know we're in it for the right reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, for care. You, you need to do it. Uh, we, I've done it. <laughs> so the, I just want to give you an example. Uh, so we reached out to uh, to Kevin when he was at DOH and Anbans uh, with molecules for chronic myeloid leukemia, uh, which wasn't available on the EML. Uh, so we had a first line molecule, imatinib, and a second line one as well that got incorporated on the EML, obviously with lots of negotiations, negotiations on price. Um, and that is now widely used. So it's another example that's different from uh, trastuzumab. And I'm going to jump in. Yeah. Look at the HPV vaccination program. Yeah. And we sat with the two drug companies, Anvan and myself. We used the common, we, we, we used the pricing committee's common document for the health technology assessment. There was weeping, there was wailing, there was gnashing of teeth from folk who, who work in um, Midrand. But they, because the prize at the end of the day was so significant for them, they, they I'm a comrades marathon. They, they ran with Anvan and I. They, did the mile and guess what? It's now an essential medicine. Yeah. Similarly, uh, the Thalassemia Association needed an oral medicine, uh, an iron chelator for patients, for babies, for young children. The only available treatment was an injectable infusion. Uh, and it took us, I think, three years with motivation from patient advocacy groups, having the right price, having all the, a lot of doctors motivated. And now, is more utilized in the public sector than there is in the private sector. So there are success stories. Now, our proposals are all based on um, the current system. Yeah. So, so ours is based on the... It's not drama, I don't like to write. Can we all just give Gavin a round of applause? <laughs> Well, it's, it's based on the current system, right? So uh, oh, to reinvent the wheel is difficult in this country. So uh, we said we'd like to see fast track drug registration for rare diseases like we see at uh, in Brazil at, with Invisa. We see it in the EU. Uh, it's something they can adopt into their reliance model. Uh, number two, remove global price visibility. We've mentioned this. And Similar to what we see in the IP website by Department of Treasury, there's a it's password protected with your ID, and any South African can access it, but anybody that's not South African can't access it. So it's 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 possible we can use that. Uh, in the public, that's there's a master procurement list easily downloadable. Similar similarly, we need that to be non-visible. Uh, arms, I'm not going to talk about because everybody spoke about Section 36.2. Uh, uh, and then uh, oncology fund for Lauren is, is an option we can look at, an oncology or rare disease fund. Whether that fund is funded from NGOs or is funded from medical aids and is centrally managed, but 
there could be some fund. There's an Australian fund as well. Uh, and the last one is, is my suggestion that I put on the slide before, and I'm going to reiterate it over and over. We have a World Health Organization EML that says this is the basic essential medicines that should be covered by a country. And we subscribe to who? And we subscribe to the EML as well. And there are oncology medicines and rare disease medicines on this list. So why can't we get the DOH to call for it so it can be reviewed on EML or we can propose it? So that's, that's why my one, there's also a, a rare disease essential medicines list by a rare disease working group of 204 medicines. It's a starting point. There's many, pembrolizumab, your medicine for non-small cell lung cancer is on the essential medicines list. <laughs> so there's many of them. And I think that's an action that is easy for us because we're using evidence that's already been generated through many uh, colleagues globally and the World Health Organization has ratified those. So, okay, thanks, we're done. Any questions? Come on, Fakir's nailed everyone. I think it's our turn. <laughs> Bring the slide back. Bring the slide back. Thanks, Fakir. That was brilliant. The idea of having only South Africans access the price information by using their identity numbers yeah. uh, would introduce another kind of state capture whereby foreign entities could get South Africans to use their ID to get that information. So that's not foolproof. Can can I you see, Vada? What happens is when we work, and many of us here from pharmaceutical companies, uh, when our global parent company knows that the price can be visible by downloading a file, they already don't. They're not willing to give us the lowest possible price or the affordable price for this country. And that's why we had to find other mechanisms like EMBs that we did with Discovery. Now, if it is password protected and there's an ID, it doesn't mean it's globally accessible. Whether they can download it or they access it through a, a side door is okay. Because we can do the same with, with, with uh, the prices in the UK. So it's not a problem. For me, uh, I don't, I'll be able to defend it with our parent company that uh, it's protected. You can't download it, you go and attempt. And you know, and it doesn't have to be ID, it can be any, anything that works. So I just wanna just add on what uh, Fakira said. So in Germany, interestingly enough, they have a similar system but there, it's not even just a simple ID or a number. You make a request, and it's approved or not, by some kind of administrator, because they have to determine whether you have, you have a need to know. <laughs> and so that, that could also be an option, because not everybody has a need to know. If you are a price file manager, you may have a need to know. If you're a funder, you have a need to know. If you're a patient, you have a right to know. But... Not everybody has a need to know or a right to know. And that happens in Germany. Probably something we can propose for you because we already have price file managers. So, so it only comes to some of us. So like two of us at Estelas get it, two of you at MSD get it, and, and, and all the price file managers from the various medical schemes and managed care organizations get it. And, and and when the when the website was down, we were still getting those price files. <laughs> so so do you think it's regulated uh, that that the DOH maintains that price file on their website? So. I looked at the regulations and it says in the prescribed format. Correct. So I asked, 
what's the prescribed format? Nobody seemed to know. So I asked Elsevier then, what's the prescribed format? And she said, uh, it means that it must be displayed on the company's website. So the single exit price must be displayed on the company's website, and that's the regulations, or not the the dog, whatever supports the regulations. So there's no, there's nothing that says there has to be a price file downloadable uh, at on the DOH website. I don't know where that that found its feet. I mean, I don't know. Um, Fakir, just a question for me. Um, it is almost three o'clock, so my brain is slowing down. Mm. Your your idea about the drugs that are on WHO's essential medicines list, how then do we incorporate them into the countries and so on? So how do you, okay. what, what what is it, right? So it's three o'clock, Laura. Right? <laughs> so so, so I, I'll try and explain it quickly. Um, we have a South African uh, essential medicines list. Uh, they claim that our South African essential medicines list is based, was originally based on the World Health Organization essential medicines list. Uh, yeah, and Pada knows that. So what I'm proposing is that medicines, we can do a comparison between what is available on the World Health Organization EML versus what is available in the South African EML. And the difference from the oncology medicines and the rare diseases medicines is what we propose going forward to the DOH, that they need to uh, call for these medicines. And then, then we can have a negotiation like, like uh, Gavin was saying on price. They can, because the value is already determined by the World Health Organization. So then we can say, at what level will it be affordable for this country? Initially, the WHO list was just a model for countries that were beginning to implement an essential medicines list to use. And at some stage, South Africa had a lot more drugs than the WHO list. But what happened is that South Africa eventually came up with a, with a system. If you look at the end of the essential medicines list, there's a form that prescribes how you should submit uh, if, if you want any new drug to replace an existing one or one that that is with a totally new indication, you do that. But the way to do it is that you have the national essential medicines list up there. Then you have the provincial ones, the PT, PTCs, provincial uh, pharmacy and techno, uh, pharma, pharmacy and, and, and what's the T stand for now? But you have the PT, yeah, therapeutics committees. And it's the specialists in the tertiary and quaternary hospitals who really matter. And I think Gavin did mention that. Those are the people who have the influence. Those are the people then who, if they buy a story for this particular drug, then they will recommend it to the National Essential Medicines List through the PTC. And that's how it works. The issue is how those medicines are procured. So in a provincial level, your hospital gets assigned a medicine bill, a, a, a budget. But you can then have a separate budget for oncology medicines and for rare diseases. So what then happens, even if the product is on the EDL, you must still make that budget work. And therein lies the problem. So it doesn't help you to have the most fancy medicine in the world on it, if it is unaffordable because I have such a small budget, I'd re rather give everybody a lick of the ice cream than one person the whole ice cream. And that is where we sit at the moment. So we need to look at how do you address that budget? So getting the molecule like trastuzumab on the EDL, ML, whatever they want to call it, is irrelevant if the budget is not made available in order to procure the medicine, irrespective of the price. Lauren, I just would like to come in quickly. So I'm also very worried about the essential medicine list, um, not only on um, in relation with cancer and all the other diseases, but at primary healthcare level. 
if that current uh, as it is being implemented under um, the, f the National Health Insurance Fund, we are going to be in trouble at primary health care level. It's a very low bar. Most of the general practitioners out there are treating patients on a, on a higher level. The bar is very, very low. We are in trouble. Okay, Fakir, you the last one, and then we're done. Thank you, doctor. Uh, you're right. The bar is very low. Uh, however, the bar is even lower in the private sector. So you'll be surprised to know that that essential medicines list uh, is what I've proposed to be incorporated into the PMBs as primary level of care. So currently in our hospice-centric private sector system, we don't have those medicines available. We don't have sometimes antidepressants. We don't sometimes have uh, uh, hormone replacement therapy, whatever's on that list. You see, it's a uh, vaccines are not there. Yeah. Okay, so we've we as as Cabello said, it's now uh, it's now three o'clock. We're heading towards three o'clock, um, and there's no afternoon tea because we're NCD NGOs. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I think we just out of this meeting, we want, Kelly and I want to come with a way forward in in next steps. So Kelly, I don't know if you want to sum up and then we look at a way forward with from the group. Yep. So I'm going to identify 11 points that have been raised that we, we're not sure what we'll do with them yet, but we'll, we'll think of something. So the one was the uniform HGA assessments. If I don't mention something that you've raised, please mention it. Uh, so the uniform health technology assessment framework, um, a risk equalization fund that seeks uh, both public and private. Um, socialized reinsurance options, uh, essential packages, uh, and redefining what the essential packages are, section 36, two exemptions, value-based pricing, uh, specific to pricing reimbursements and transparency, um, that focuses also on episodes of care, so not focused necessarily on the intervention, uh, centralized health records, and pushing that forward, uh, measuring impact in terms of value and quantity, um, unified efforts in terms of the World Health Organization as well, non-visible net pricing mechanisms and a comparison between the WHO EML list and ours to see what products have been left off. And again, not necessarily sure what we do with that information once we've got it, but certainly this is not going to be the last discussion. For them to report back. No, they oh, okay. Yeah. And then number 12 is world peace. <laughs> oh, I think I don't know if you may you may have mentioned it or alluded to it um, but data and registrars yes uh, and, and that's important in, in terms of measuring framework. outcomes and and as a, as a key input to prioritizing resource allocation and I wasn't listening to you do you have the governance framework there very good point thanks as well lucky number 13 Comfort. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, patient centric. There's six tables. We'll assign two a table. Meet back in six months. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now comes now you can just see a mass exodus out the out the door. So one of the things that has been happening is that we've had um two people capturing or three people capturing the discussion and the notes that have come out and we've recorded it. And I think one of the things that we um, would like to do is to um, put a report out on this, maybe with a little bit of a call to action. When I say a little bit of a call to action, it's not the um, strength of the call to action that I'm assigning it, but also doing that call to action and then starting to meet on how do we deliver on that call to action um, in the in the coming months? And I'm not I'm not going to say weeks, months, uh, because it's what the sixth of what's the date? <laughs> yeah, so I'm tired. I'm like on month fourteen. It's like the fourteenth month of the year at this stage. 
Um, so I think, you know, is there any, are there any other um, uh, ideas on taking this forward? I know that we, we would say that, um, that you know that these have happened before and the and the discussions on that but one of the things that we would propose is that we drive it forward from a patient group point of view um and that this gets driven from that obviously with engagement from everyone else because we can't do it without all the stakeholders holders at the same room i'm going to interject yes. to say we're going to do it with your support will be quicker and easier and less painful <laughs> for us yeah. um, <laughs> um so so yeah I, um i want to thank all of you for your input um i think that it was great having so many people to input and 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 support um i think kelly and i yes yeah. Off I wanted to ask, sorry, we, uh, we've we heard numerous times today, we've had these discussions for years. Was today's different? No. No, man. Had to have been. <laughs> Only time will tell. Good. That's a good Thank yeah, you. That's, yes. a fair, that's a fair. I think okay. from my perspective, we today was the one time that I felt like everyone had an opportunity to put forward something, which we don't often get. So... I just, yeah, from my perspective, thanks to everyone for sharing your opinions and your thoughts. Almost, 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 sorry. <laughs> so I just want to say, look, we held this conversation in the context of Pillar of the Health Compact. Um, I Would it be asking too much to see how we can find a way to loop back into that? and to hopefully going forward, get a little bit more participation from those people that are supposed to be driving it. Thank you, that's the only request I have. Political will. Um, if I can, I'd like to just ask our speakers to come up and get like a really small thank you. Again, highlighting that we are nonprofits. Um, <laughs> you don't expect too much, right? Hannes gets two. <laughs> so, um, Nolu, uh, Nolu's left, but Nuri, if you could maybe come up and grab for her, please. These little, we have given everybody little rare bears. These are our innovation. <laughs> so rare bears are actually, we've taught women in the Kaya Sands community to crochet uh, those little bears, and then they are handed out. They are donated back to patients who are newly diagnosed, but they are also available for purchase. But the point I'm trying to make there was a need to give our patients something that made them feel loved and appreciated. We had women who couldn't put bread on the table for their kids. And a simple intervention, none of them look the same. Literally, some of them, you don't even know what they are. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, need a good, you need a good imagination some days. But this employs like 60 women. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, Right, uh, Zueli, maybe you can take the Zueli, please. The pink one, really, Comfort? No, okay, the blue one. <laughs> Blingy? Um, Hannes? Hannes gets two, huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, and is anyone seeing Kaklefo from BHF anytime soon? Mm -mm. We'll have to. Fine, we'll deliver it. Someone will drop it off. Their offices, yeah, well, are, their offices are down the road. Who do it? <laughs> and then also just to say there was um, there was three people that have really helped in putting this meeting together. So we just wanted to say Vicky, Bongi, Lizzie, just a big thank you. And a big thank you to Pasta for the support as well. And I then for Q. Without you guys. And for Q. He can get for for kid can get a pink one. No, yeah. For kid, you want pink and orange or pink and blue? Your, which one would your daughter like, the pink and blue or the pink and orange? <laughs> there's a there's a, a quasi giraffe and a quasi giraffe. reindeer. Get a chance to speak for the next time. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you. So yeah, with that, I think um, just a massive thank you to everyone for participating today. Thanks to everyone for coming through, sharing your views. 
and minute. you forgot shark. No, I gave him his before he left. Oh, shark! shark. There he is. <laughs> So Apparently, you don't get counted if you stay the whole time. <laughs> no, sorry, I was thinking of Ernest. I gave his before you left. Sorry, so you stuck with the pink and orange now. <laughs> hopefully, the, the hopefully the pink and orange goes with the Opa folder. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, please, will you return your name badges? Not because of price, just because we looking after the environment. Don't, don't lie, it's because of price. <laughs> don't, don't get funny now, it's because of price. Come on. <laughs> environment. But we do cancer and rare disease. Someone else has to look after the virus. I can't do everything, okay? <laughs> okay, everyone, thank you very much. We'll be, dis we'll be working on that document and keep you updated on that. Can thank you for your photo? time. A team photo in the front.
Thank you.